Good evening and welcome to November 17th, 2021 Select Board meeting. I call this meeting to order at 7.04. I thank everybody for uh, attending uh, virtually uh, at, at Ashland Zoom meeting. So in accordance with the governor's order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 30A and Subsection 20, and all public meetings are being conducted remotely. Following these requirements of the open, open meeting law, please be advised that this meeting is being recorded and broadcast by WACA TV and on Facebook. The town of Ashland, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, is currently following the guidance from the Ashland Board of Health, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and the CDC regarding the virus and the steps communities can take to prevent the spread of COVID-19 virus. Tonight's Zoom meeting, the ID number is 812-4124-0047, and the passcode is 454-731. With that, <clears throat> I will ask anybody who is in the meeting room or in, in uh, our meeting this evening for citizens' participation. Do I have anybody here that would like to? Oh, uh, there's Mr. Sony raising his hand. Mark, unmute yourself. There you go. Okay, good evening. Thank you. Nice uh, November crisp night we have here, and weather wise, we're doing well. And how's everything go? All everybody online here. How's everybody doing? We're doing just fine, Mark. And um, I'd like to, through the chairman, back to you and to Steve Mitchell and everybody that's on the public safety building. It's got to be an early Christmas to unwrap that building once everything gets going. You're right, Mark. Um, I know you were, you were present at our last meeting, and uh, it was a very productive meeting, a very good meeting. And uh, things are moving very quickly and moving right along. Uh, and as you heard Mr. Nagel uh, tell us and John <coughs> tell us about the fact that uh, in a few weeks, uh, you probably won't see a lot of work being done uh, because it's all interior work that we'll be doing uh, with wiring and things of that nature. So you probably won't see a lot of improvements and a lot of uh, work completed because everything is being done inside the building. As you know, as as time goes on, and the, in the inside is where the presence always is in that box. Now you'd be able to keep it under wraps and they have that dedication coming up soon. Well, hopefully soon. But they they uh, they tell us that uh, things are pretty well on 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 schedule, and uh, we'll just keep our fingers crossed that we don't put the whammy on it. And uh, from this point on, so we'll just uh, <laughs> just keep things going nice and smooth. And from one building, Mr. Chairman, to the, to Mr. Michael Herbert about the and Jen too, about the mill building. Talk about another talk about another informational meeting that was great to know what's going on. And I I did not know that I can be I can be informed and being told that I got I got a little. Key, keynote thing with the form base codes in there. Yeah, it's a, it's a critical piece, Mark, of that downtown zoning. How critical is are my inputs now that I'm trying to help out with the Ashton downtown districts and all? You, could, you know, Mark, you're, you've become an expert in form base code. So I, I think your input input can be very helpful. I know you're having a dialogue with Pete. So I think he yeah, thinks it's and, too. Uh, excuse, yeah, Sorry. And I, uh, yeah, yeah, we haven't talked this week. I figured he's, he's busy with other, other items and all that stuff. And um, it, it is what I'm, I've been trying to do for some years is to get this town economically going now. And now we've got a, the public safety building that is getting there. We're going to get a new Mendez school, hopefully going soon, built and all. 
So I'm educated in the town, but then again, I never graduated from NASA, but now I'm getting the keynote speakers with the form base. Mm. So that's, that's me being in a nutshell and all else that I don't get caught on, my dad has me by the short leash and everything is well here too. Thank you. Doug. Okay. Your, your dad's a smart man. Yep. He is. He's, <laughs> and he's still strong. He certainly is. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate those comments and uh, some great observations that you made uh, regarding those meetings. Um, we're a little early, I believe, before we start. So let me just quickly check here. Oh, we have one minute to go before property uh, tax classifications. And um, Let's see, do I? Uh, yeah. How about that? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. Well, that's the cover page <clears throat> for uh, fiscal year 2022's classification hearing. Uh, <clears throat> And the hearing has been opened, correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. All right, let's jump to page one. Um, this is basically just a breakdown of, of what happened over the past year um, in terms of uh, assessments and the different subcategories on the residential side and also on the commercial, industrial and personal property side. Um, everything is up, uh, no surprise there. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> keep in mind these uh, fiscal year 2022's assessments townwide are based on the activity from calendar year 2020. Uh, in the assessing world, there's always a lag time, uh, anywhere between uh, 12 and 24 months. Um, it um, gets kind of cumbersome sometimes, but uh, that's just the way the uh, legislation is, has set it up through the Mass General Laws. Um, so on this page, you can see uh, the increases to the single family class, that's by far the largest class. Uh, of parcels in town um, and on average, keep in mind, this is the approximate average of six and a half percent increase from last year, those assessments, and that's average. Uh, some may see five, some may see 7% increase. It depends. Uh, there's a lot of different variables involved. Um, if you <clears throat> go across the line, you can, get a, uh, a sense of the increase in terms of taxes from last year to this year. You can see the average single family assessment jumped up from 491, 800, 521,200 this year. Um, what happens when everything goes up? The tax rate comes down. It's an inverse operation. So, uh, this year, it looks like the tax rate's gonna drop considerably from last year. Uh, the, the current tax rate right now is $15.93 per thousand. Uh, it's estimated to drop down to $15.46 per thousand. Now that's just an estimate. Um, nothing's been approved by the state. Um, things do change towards the end of the tax rate setting process. Uh, in, in mostly on the levy. Uh, so once that gets settled, there may be a, a, a change, uh, a penny or two, but this is a pretty good estimate right now. So the end result for an increase for the, uh, the average single family home, uh, $224 in their tax bill. Rich, can I, ask, can I ask you to stop for one quick second? And Mike, can yes, you go ahead, Joe. take away uh, the sharing of the screen so I can read the... Uh... The next public hearing, which is at 720. And yep. I'm at 721 right now.
Uh, okay, yeah. Stop share. That's what you want. Yep, thank you. Yes. Appreciate that. Okay. Legal notice of the town of Ashland. Notice is hereby given that the select board will conduct a hearing layout for the High Street Extension and Weaver Road, plan dated June 29th, 2021. A public hearing will be held on this matter at Ashland Town Hall, 101 Main Street, Ashland Mass, virtually on Wednesday, November 17th, 2021, at 7.20 p.m. Parties wishing to be heard on this matter are invited to attend the public meeting by logging into Zoom, and the Zoom link can be found under the meeting calendar on the town's website ashlandmash.com. Interested parties who are unable to attend the hearing may submit written comments to the board, select board's office, Town Hall, 101 Main Street, Ashland, Mass, 01721, or by emailing Sue Roby at sroby at ashlandmass.com. Can I ask somebody to make a motion to suspend this hearing until we're done with our classification? So moved. Second. There's a second. There a second. Voice vote, please. Greaves, aye. Mitchell, aye. Kinsman, aye. Chair, aye. Vignani, aye. Okay, that's 5 0. And with that, thank you. I hope everybody understands that. So, Rich, if you can continue, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's just finish up this page uh, and before we move on to the next one. Um, just going down the list here, the condominiums were up around 4%, but that's an average. Um, multifamily, the two and three family homes, uh, they saw a, a big jump at 10%. Um, now, again, this is all based on activity in 2020. Uh, next year at this time, we'll be talking about what happened in the year 2021 calendar year. Um, further on down, you can see the large apartments, uh, big increase, mixed use, uh, commercial industrial about three and a half percent. Now down here at the bottom, personal property, uh, you can see that that increased 32 percent. Um, it's a little misleading. Uh, that number, I, went, I would say uh, 30 percent of that 32 30, percent comes from Two utilities, uh, the gas and the electric utilities. The uh, what happened was the Department of Revenue changed um, the method of calculation for these utilities uh, this year. Um, so what happens is the assessments for the gas and electric uh, almost doubled, um, just jumped considerably. I think it might be just a, a one-time thing for each community, but those two uh, utilities. Um, really have provided a lot of, uh, lot of uh, assessment um, contributing to the, the overall town-wide assessment. Um, so if there are any more questions, I'll go on to the next page. Okay, on this page, um, it just gives you a comparison from last year to this year. And you can see um, the increase in, in growth and in assessment and value in town from last year to this year, uh, uh, almost two, $200 million uh, from last year to this year. Um, the assessments are way up and, and there's, there's uh, um, that's the result of, of assessments. Um, and I, I, looking ahead to next year, I, I, I want to say that the uh, same thing's going to happen for next year, maybe even more. Um, it's just the, the, the market activity um, is just gone wild. Um, and it's all just contributing to uh, higher assessments in town, which in turn pushes down the tax rate. Um, but anyway, here are the breakdowns uh, this year compared to last year. Uh, you can see the different different classes and uh, comparing the two. 
Uh, down at the bottom, um, we have two classes. We have the uh, residential and open space. Um, this year, they make up uh, almost 90.5% of the town valuation. And commercial, industrial, and personal property make up the other 9.5%. Um, the uh, CIP, commercial, industrial, personal property uh, valuation is up a little bit, which means the percentage ticked up a little bit. Um, but most of that comes from that personal property that's, um, that I just talked about um, that contributed to a, a higher uh, valuation on that side of it, the CIP. Um, if there aren't any questions, I'll, I'll move on to the next page. Uh, there it is. Okay. Um, up top again, it's just a breakdown from residential open space, commercial, industrial, and personal property. So you can see the different percentages. They all add up to 100%. Um, We've got an estimated levy of 51,624,390. And again, that's an estimate that may change. And it usually does towards the end of the, uh, the tax setting process. Uh, once the uh, financials are, are submitted to the Department of Revenue, uh, there's always you know little changes here and there. Again, estimated uh, tax rate. This is a single tax rate. It would be $15.46 uh, if everything stayed the same. Um, before I go on, I just want to jump to the very bottom and just, uh, I know you've already seen this, but uh, the Board of Assessors did take a vote this afternoon, this afternoon at their meeting to recommend a single tax rate uh, for th this fiscal year, fiscal year 2022. Um, this graph, uh, right here, it shows you uh, in increments of 5%, what would happen uh, if the decision was made to uh, shift the burden or the, uh, the tax base um, from uh, the residential to the commercial side. It just shows you again in increments of 5%. Um, I'll use 5% as an example. Uh, that from that single tax rate of $15.46, uh, if, if the town were to shift 5%, uh, it would mean a drop in that tax rate on the residential side of $0.08. Cents. On the commercial side, it would jump up $0.78. Cents. So you can see all the way down to the bottom at 50%, that's the highest you can go, uh, there's a big <laughs> jump there. So um, in summary, um, on the residential side, uh, sometimes it, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to uh, you know, classify or split that tax rate because the saving, you save a little bit on the residential side and the tax rate, but the commercial side uh, increases quite a bit. Um, that, those are your trade-offs right there. So again, the Board of Assessors uh, recommend a, a single tax rate for this year. Rich, I have a question for you. Um, so because we have like over 90% residential, um, I think that's why we're seeing that, that if we shifted the, the, um, the rate, it would, it, would have some, it would have a minimal impact on residential and a bigger impact on commercial. Correct. What would be the percentage of the split that, you know, instead of 90, 10, what, what percentage would make sense for us to do a split rate? Um, I don't, personally, I don't think it, it, it makes sense to split the rate. Um, let me just jump back to uh, the second page real quick. Um, 
right in here, uh, you can see the, the splits of uh, 90, almost 90.5% on residential and then commercial, industrial, personal property at 9.5. Um, it's just not enough, to be honest. Um, generally, um, the, the rule of thumb is um, anything above 85% really doesn't warrant any type of a split. Um, it's just not, not beneficial uh, to the community. It's just not enough commercial, industrial, and personal property. And to be honest with you, if it weren't for the utilities uh, jumping up so much, um, this percentage would, would be a little bit lower, which would mean a higher percentage for the, for the residential. So um, we're really heavy on the residential side um, for a community. And the, the, the rate itself right now dropping down to $15 and 46 cents. Um, that, that's pretty low. Um, I don't have the other communities in front of me, but I, I think if you looked around, you'd find that Ashland um, was definitely lower than a lot of the surrounding communities that have a single rate. Okay, that's helpful. Um, one other question. Sure. Is just to talk about how the tax levy and, and how like a two and a half percent raise in the tax levy factors into the assessments as well, because I know that it's an inverse, it's an inverse relationship with the tax rate and the assessments, but I, I think it's just also helpful if people understand sort of how the, the levy increase uh, factors. Okay. In. Well, there's really, there's it's really two ways levies going to increase from one year to the next. Um, each year it increases two and a half percent over the previous year. And also whatever new growth um, that is picked up and certified by the Department of Revenue, that's also added in to the levy. So the levy is always going to be expanding. Um, again, by mostly by those two things the uh, the two and a half percent and the allowable new growth. Um, so uh, the levy will does have to expand and basically the levy it's, is set up to um, you know pay for a lot of the services in town. Um, that, that's that's kind of the way it works. Um, so you know basically. Um, you know, and you talked about the inverse, where where um, as as the uh, the assessments or the assessed value of the town goes up, it does push down the uh, the tax rate itself. But um, you also have to figure in um, the the levy amount. So essentially, the smaller the levy, um, that that's going to mean a, a smaller tax rate. Um, and, and conversely, the larger the levy um, is, is going to result in a, in a larger tax rate. Uh, I hope I'm explaining that um, in a way that, that you can understand. No, it's helpful. I just yeah. want people to understand that just, just because their assessment, their, their home assessments are going up, right. doesn't necessarily translate directly into you know, more tax, a, a tremendous amount more taxes. Right, right. Down. And also that they're not being taxed at a rate that's, that's higher because all of that is factored in. Yes. No, they, they won't. Because um, what happens is the, the average taxpayer, you know, we'll say the average single family home taxpayer, um, he sees his assessment increase somewhat, but then, um, multiplied by a, a, a lower tax rate, it kind of evens out from the previous year, uh, probably a little bit more, a little bit, you know, a modest increase from year to year, but that's to be expected because, uh, you know, the town services uh, don't stay stagnant. Uh, they always increase modestly from year to year. So it just, that's how it all works out. Um, I just um, just to follow up on that a little bit, Rich. So sure. on your first page, um, you showed the average uh, 
assessment increase of six something percent. Yes. But, um, and then you showed the average tax increase, which I thought was uh, based on that. But I think, uh, you know, my, my suggestion is that the one percent you're missing is the rise in people's average tax bill, which I just calculated is about 2.8 percent, which so um, so that'd be my suggestion in this, you know, to add that number to that page you showed us. The 224, whatever it was, I didn't write. Um, uh, $224. Yeah, over seven, uh, whatever the base is, is about 2.8%. I think that's a valuable kind of average number. And then right. following up on that, I guess, um, you know, why wouldn't it be closer to 2.5%, for example, you know, as the, uh, the evaluation uh, limit? Like what's, what, what kind of impacts that a bit? Uh, the levy? And and the uh, the assessment itself, but uh, the overall assessment, but the levy does figure in quite a bit into that equation. So, so people aren't going to look at exactly a two point five percent increase. There's going to be some variation, right? Exactly. Right. And I don't think mo most people look at um, a percentage. I mean, they may, and, and it is considerable. I do. I want to know what percentage my taxes are rising. Yeah. Uh, well, exactly. I, that, you know, when I look at my tax bill, um, I look at dollars and cents like, wow, mine yep. went up $200 from last year. Right. But when you break it down per month, um, it's, it's not a lot from, from the, well, that's a value year. judgment. And I'm not arguing with that. I'm just saying, I think it's useful to have that other percentage. Yeah. So, Rich, Rich, I think it's also important. Rob, I think that's a very good point, and I think it's a good number to have. Um, just to extrapolate a little bit on what Rich is saying, uh, if you go back to the classes, uh, you know, whether it's single family, condo, commercial, I think it had large apartments, you know, like the single family value increased 6% overall, but the condo value, I believe, increased 4%. So that's also factoring into how the average oh, single sure. family yeah, tax yeah. Bill right. would go up. Right. Um, I mean, we have to, the condos, I, I think, saw a pretty significant increase in their assessment a couple of years ago. And our town, I mean, people might not know this, but 33% of our housing stock um, are condos. So, it, you know, a big swing in that is going to have an, an impact, a pretty large impact everywhere else. Yeah, we do yeah, have a lot um, of condos. Right. And the only other thing I wanted to add, and we talked, Rich, you mentioned personal property, and uh, we talked a little bit about it, um, you know, in terms of coming revenue sources. Just wanted to make sure that, you know, you have good communication systems to get at changes in personal property. Um, so, you know, have systems like that. So, right. Right. We do. We outsource it to a third party. We have a vendor that. Uh, works with the personal property and, and collects the personal property uh, for us on an annual basis. Okay. Mm. I have a question, Rich. Uh, take away Framingham, take away Natick. Uh, look at uh, some of our other Metro West neighbors. Anybody have a split rate? Um, I don't know of any other community um, other than Framingham. I can't think of uh, any offhand. Okay, so a rule, the, the, the general rule is unless you're hitting at least that 15% threshold, communities are going with a, with, a, with a single rate. Yes, that's always a rule of thumb, right. Right. Okay, good. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> so, Rich, the recommendation of the assessors is to... Uh, continue with a single rate, correct? Yes. Okay. So just uh, for the board's information, um, the board would be voting on that, on whether to adopt a split rate or a single rate. Uh, we then will continue the hearing till after town meeting because um, if any appropriations are made at town meeting, we'll need to adjust that on the recap sheet. And um, then we'll close the hearing on December 8th. At our next meeting. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Are we ready to take that vote now? I am. 
Sure. I move that we approve the recommendation from the Board of Assessors for a single tax rate for the fiscal year of 2022. Is there a second? Thank second. you. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, voice vote, please. Reeves, aye. Mitchell, aye. Chair, aye. Kingsman, aye. Mignani, aye. So that's 5 0. Rich, thank you for all your hard work. Um, thank you, Joe. Everybody yes, thank in the you. office, thank you very much. Uh, you made a difficult uh, discussion a lot easier to understand, and hopefully those who are watching, if they still have any questions, I'm sure they can contact you, and this will be up on our website in the town hall, uh, in, in the town website, so uh, okay, they, yeah. uh, keep reading. I just it. want to note that one of the assessors, our elected assessors is here, David Rosenblum. Uh, hope we did okay, Dave. But uh, <laughs> great, great work, David. Thank you for all your work, guys. Greatly appreciate it. So okay, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Okay. So I'm going to add the other motion, Joe. Yes. I, I move that we suspend the hearing until the December 8th, 2021 select board meeting. After, after the time meeting, right. Is yep. there a second to that? Second. Okay, do a voice vote, please. Greaves, aye. Mitchell, aye. Here I. Minyani. Minyani, yeah, and that also was five zero. Okay, we will suspend this hearing until uh, December eighth after the town meeting. So thank you, Rich. Thank you, Michael, thank for you, getting that all straightened out for us. We appreciate it. And David, thank you. You guys have a nice Thanksgiving. If we don't see you before then. Thanks. Okay. We're moving right along. Okay, <clears throat> I would like to ask uh, and make a motion to reopen the hearing for the uh, uh, road layout hearing for High Street Extension and Weaver Road at this time. So moved. Second. Okay, second. All those in favor, voice vote, please. Reeves, aye. Mitchell, aye. Here, aye. Mignani, aye. Yep, and Mignani, aye. All right, that's five zero. Uh, any individual or individuals who are present to um, be part of this discussion, please uh, unmute yourself and, and identify yourself at this time. So who's presenting this, Joe or Michael? I'm, I'm not sure. I believe, well, I see Steve, Steve Hickey's here, so I'm assuming it may be Steve. Yeah, I was going to give Steve an opportunity to jump in, but um, I can certainly start us off. Okay, so, Michael, go ahead. Yeah, so this is a road layout hearing <clears throat> uh, for street acceptance for both High Street Extension and Weaver Road. Um, so just so everybody understands the process, what happens uh, before this is our DPW as well our, as our peer reviewer, which is GCG, uh, reviews the road, makes sure that it meets all the town standards and criteria. Once that is done, we can put it before the select board and the planning board who both need to um, vote on these street acceptances. Um, but really the most important vote and the critical vote is at town meeting uh, on December 1st where it needs to be accepted by town meeting. So this means that we'll need to, um, you know, once we adopt this, first of all, it gets added to our chapter 90 mileage. So it should help there, but we also, um, absorb the responsibility for maintaining it. And Michael, at this point, has uh, the DPW uh, approved what they've seen up there? I mean, I drove up there today because uh, this has always been a pet peeve of mine. Uh, developers, you know, complete a project and then, you know, we accept these roads and then two or three years down the road, we end up paying an amount of money to resolve issues. So it was just excuse me, curious if we uh, have the DPW's approval on, on those roads up roadways at this time. So we do, we do have Doug's approval as well as the peer reviewers approval. Are there any buddies or any, any residents uh, that are here tonight that have any comments or questions or concerns? If you do raise your hand, please, and we'd be happy to call on you. I just saw Steve Hickey. Oh, there he is. Hi, Stephen. How are you doing? 
Good. How are you? Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you fine, Steve. All right. Apologize. Apologies for before. I, I had some uh, difficulties on my end. Now I, I got them so. Hey, we did uh, too, Steve. Yeah. You're not I the have, only I one. Have, I, I, Michael, I think, said it best from what I heard. I have really nothing to add. If there's any questions here, I can answer. Okay. Sounds good. So there are no additional questions from any of the board members for Stephen and or uh, Michael at this point. Okay. Okay. So I, I do want to add one caveat. I'm sorry, and you might see this on your proposed motion, but I just want to explain it. Um, there is what this vote would be is a conditional to title certification being approved by town council to town meeting. So we just want to make sure all the, the title issues, if there are any, are squared away. So it would be approval with that contingency. We need to close the hearing first, right, before we do any kind of motions. Yes, sorry. Okay. sorry That's okay. That. Sorry. 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 So is there, Joe, you're muted if you're trying to talk to us. I will ask uh, those uh, to make a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Is there a second? Okay. Uh, all, uh, voice vote, please. Greaves, aye. Mitchell, aye. Bear, aye. Mignani, aye. Mignani, aye. Okay. Um, with that. Um, <clears throat> um, just a question. Ready? I don't think this is part of the... Um, so the, the quit claim deed, Michael, that's in our packet. Right. That's just him giving the property to uh, handing the property over to the town. Correct. Okay. Just double checking. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I move that we approve the street layout for high street and Weaver road conditional to the title certification being approved by town council prior, prior to town meeting. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Voice vote, please. Greaves, aye. Mitchell, aye. Bear, aye. Kingsman, aye. Mignani, aye. Thank you all. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so just one final follow-up. I'm sorry, Joe. Good, Steve. Uh, John, Michael. So we do have the Mylars here in the office. Um, you don't need to sign them right away, but um, they're here when you're ready to. For us to sign. Yep. Okay. Do we need to have those signed before town meeting though, right? It's best if we do, yes. Okay. Yeah. So if you guys can do this before the holiday uh, yep. coming up, maybe maybe Friday, that would be, oh, the office isn't open, but maybe tomorrow. Probably. Yeah, maybe tomorrow if you can do it, that would be great. Okay. Moving right along. That is awesome. Next hearing. Yeah, uh, next hearing. And let me get that all set up for me. Do, 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 do. There's a notice, it's hereby given that the select board will conduct a hearing regarding a change of manager at Stones Public House, Long Acre Inc., DBA Stones Public House, 179 Main Street, Ashland, Mass., 01721. A public hearing will be held on this matter on Wednesday, November 17th. 2021 at 730. I apologize for running a little late, but sometimes these things happen when we're dealing with many issues. Persons wishing to be heard on this matter are invited to attend the public hearing in person or by logging into the Zoom meeting. Interested parties who are unable to attend may submit in writing comments to the Select Board's office, Town Hall 101 Main Street, Ashland, Mass, 01721, or by emailing Sue Roby at srobyashlandmass.com. With that, I would like to entertain a motion to open a hearing. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. A voice vote, please. Reeves, aye. Mitchell, aye. Bear, aye. Then aye. Mignani, aye. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm assuming, Aiden, are you going to be uh, discussing this matter or Greg, is it going to be you, Greg? Uh, yes. It's okay. Greg. 
Greg, if you don't mind, we know who you are, but if you introduce yourself to those who are, are watching on cable, that would be great. Sure. Uh, Greg Bergeron uh, and manager at Stones Public House in Ashland. Okay. I'm sure everybody had the opportunity to uh, look over the uh, the applications. Uh, it's pretty it's pretty uh, uh, straightforward. All we're doing is changing uh, managers. Is that right, Greg? We're not doing anything else, just changing the managers. That's Is correct. It? Okay. <clears throat> Any questions? Is is the uh, the new manager in attendance? That's me. <laughs> no, that is you. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Don't mind me. Okay. Um, do you have any questions for us? Um, I don't believe so. Um, I was the manager here from 2007 to 2015. Um, so I'm relatively familiar with the policies um, and procedures of managing a restaurant in the town of Ashland. I live here with my family as well. Um, so happy to be back on board and hopefully a brighter future post COVID. And hopefully by that time, the construction will be completed. <laughs> One of these days. <laughs> but good to see the, uh, uh, the upgrading of the exterior stones uh, recently. Well, yeah, it's, um, it was, uh, you know, we were getting close to a safety hazard um, as far as a few <laughs> of the items that we took care of, but um you know, we want to participate in the uh, upgrade of the downtown frontage and, um, and do our part just the same. We, we do look forward to the completion of the project and, uh, you know, as much, a, as much of a pain as it can be from time to time, uh, the, you know, the uh, forest through the trees is, is, a, is a proper way to, to visualize it. Mm -hmm. Hopefully the, the construction isn't impacting you guys too much. Um, right they've been, they've been pretty good. Um, the past week they're down on the corner, but they are allowing, um, access. So it hasn't impacted us okay. too negatively. Good. 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 That's, that's good to hear. Steve, you have any, uh, no, Rob, any, anything? Uh, no, I, I, actually, I was wondering, are you, are you taking care of the underground railroad room that was discovered there? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's still there. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, just uh, kind of punched out. We, you know, respect the history. Right. Um, so we, we have no, no uh, reason to, you know, change anything in regards to that. That's wonderful. Good to hear. Yeah, no, I have no questions about this application. Straightforward. History is important. Yeah. Thank you. Motion to close the hearing. Second. Joe, you're still muted. Greaves, yeah. aye. Yeah. Mitchell, aye. Here, aye. Kingsman, aye. Minyani, aye. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. No, hold on uh, a second. We, now, have to, we have to vote um, you in. We just motion, closed the hearing. Motion Sorry. to approve the change of managers for Stones Public House. Do we need to Thank name you. Greg as part of the motion or no? No. Don't need no, to. So. Okay. All right. Then there was a second. So voice vote, please. Greaves, aye. Mitchell, aye. Beer, aye. Minyani, aye. Minyani, aye. Okay, Greg, congratulations. Okay. Uh, Thank you, wish everyone. You, wish you luck. And, uh, Look Thank forward you. to a, a successful business practice over there. So good luck to you all. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. you too. Take Thank care. You. All right. Joe, you're muted. Keep hitting mute, Joe. Unmute. I think the Joe was the one that ended the meeting. Actually, <laughs> <It> was... <laughs> I actually there did. There you go. <laughs> no, I actually, I, I did. I said I wanted to have the, the quickest meeting in history. And it almost oh. worked. Almost <laughs> worked. Okay. Um, 
seven. Well, we have a, we had a, a meeting uh, scheduled for seven forty-five uh, with area, and uh, I see many representatives here from area. So if they could unmute themselves, like I just did, uh, we welcome you and please introduce yourself to those who uh, don't know you all. Thank you. Uh, Hi, everybody. This is Alan, uh, Hi, Alan, board member of area. Joined by my team here, we have our president, Maggie, Ray, another board member, Moala, our treasurer, and Senti, who's another board member. Good evening, all, and welcome, and thank you for being here. Appreciate Good all what you're doing. Us. Nice to have thank you, you all. Thank you for having us. So I, I emailed a PowerPoint. I don't know if uh, you got a chance to receive it or review it. Michael, I know that um, I have it. Are you, do you have it up? Are you, I don't know if I can share my screen. I can share my screen, I have it. Okay. Oh, I don't have a punt. Yeah. You, you, you know, need to make you a co-host. You should be yep, okay. Now you are, Alan. Okay. Can anybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. We're good. Perfect. All right. Before we get going here, I'll, as we're doing all our meetings, I'll start with our mission statement. Uh, area is a group of people of color and their allies in Ashland working together to ensure that their voices are represented in local civic organizations, government, and schools. We support and promote people of color run businesses in Metro West as engines of economic development that benefit the community at lunch. Through community action, we want to make Ashland safe and inclusive as a community for all. So this slide uh, that you had a chance to review had a lot of pages and I won't go through each one of them. Um, I'll highlight key features from some of them in the interest of time. So that's our mission statement. And these are the board members, many of whom are already here. Uh, our president, Maggie, our vice president, Barbara, our secretary, Kara, was unable to make it. Moala is around, our treasurer. And then uh, we have three board members, myself, Alan, Galiwango, Santiza, and Raymond. So area was created uh, in 2020, after the tragedies that uh, saw the loss of lives of uh, key black figures like Ob Ahmad Abari, uh, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. It was started when two mothers felt the need to take action and with the support of their friends and community, we wanted to make a difference in Ashland. Over the last uh, year, we've grown to over 150 members and we have board members actively participating in uh, different town boards like the Housing Trust or the Ashland Council. And we have three focal committees. One, the school committee, the business, and the civic and government committee. We meet uh, every month, the third Thursday of the month at around 5.30. So the school committee is led by uh, Alan and Maggie. And our goals are focusing on diversity in education. We want to promote diverse hiring practices uh, such that the students, could, students of color can see teachers that look like them. We also want to promote diversity and inclusivity by providing books and media that are accurately depicting the community. Some of the achievements we've seen so far are, we have biweekly meetings and collaboration with the Ashland public school teachers and leaders like uh, Mike Kyra and Kelly Senko. We also have a sophomore speaker series going on with uh, Corey McGann, where we have people of color leaders in business speaking to students so they can see them and inspire them to different career paths. We've also provided diverse reading publications to the Ashland Public School so that they can integrate it into their curriculum. 
And we also send out monthly newsletters to the area community to help educate them about diverse topics. Next, we have the business committee that's led by Raymond Chitaimbo and Santeza Chironde. Their main goals are connecting local people of color run businesses with Ashland Business Association. And they also work to champion local minority owned businesses in Ashland. So some of the achievements they've had are increased visibility, traffic and support for PUC owned businesses. They've worked with businesses like Uppercuts to help them get a new business location. Uh, they're also working with knowledge points to help increase traffic through advertising. They've also partnered with the Ashland Farmers Market. Uh, we've had a table at the various uh, setups on Saturdays uh, to promote diversity and inclusion within the community. We regularly post these POC businesses on our website as a way to increase visibility. Last but not least, we have the Civic and Government Committee. They work to promote uh, access to the town uh, committees and civic engagement groups. We're also collaborating with the Ashland Police Department to strategically evaluate hiring practices and explore ways to get out of civil service. Area has encouraged and supported many Ashland residents of color to get involved in town affairs. So at present, we have members in the Ashland Housing Trust, the Cultural Council, and the ABA, the Ashland Business Association. Area also met with the town manager and Chief Rich Briggs to discuss more ways of coordination with the Ashland Police Department and people of color. Our members are also engaging with other local town groups like Decisions at Every Turn, Ashland Business Council, the Ashland Dog Park, and the Ashland Farmers Market. Uh, so last but not least, the numbers, most important thing. So currently we approximately need about uh, 5,000 to sustain annual ongoing operational costs. And to the right side, we break down estimates of what expenses we run through we are a grassroots organization that so far has been supported by uh, some generous donations from members of the town, but also the board are donating their own money to keep the lights on, basically. So we're in the process of applying for 501c uh, status uh, so we can, it can help us uh, solicit more donations. We also have a website that has costs in hosting and also maintenance. We have a Google domain for handling our mail and communications. We also maintain a post office box that has fees we pay for. And then going forward, we've been putting up marketing campaigns, whether it's at the Ashland uh, Farmer's Market or various uh, events at the corner spot. And for those events, we purchase banners and business cards, which cost money we also want to send our teams to leadership and education programs and also set up a scholarship for high school kids. Uh, and then last but not least, we want to create outreach activities. Uh, an idea that we've thrown around is a signature cultural celebration event uh, that would require some funding to get off the ground. The final slide just shows uh, different ways uh, you can support area if you feel so inclined. Uh, we take checks or Venmo. Thank you. Great presentation, Alan, thank you. I'll open it up to the board for any questions, comments, or does anybody, uh from area uh, who are represented here this evening that are here this evening. Would they have anything else you would like to add? Um, well, welcome to welcome to the meeting and welcome to town. Um, nice to see everybody here. It's a, I think it's a program that's uh, well worth the, uh, the effort that needs to get done. Um, to me, it's long overdue, but that's, that's me. And, um,
I'm sure I'll feel the same way. So uh, nice to all have you here and, and, and stay in this style. Alan, I, I know Alan a little bit better than some of the others, unfortunately. Uh, we have the ability to work on the Affordable Housing Trust together, and uh, which, it, which, it, which is great. And, and Barbara as well, but I don't see Barbara here this evening, so um, which, is, which is really nice. So I'll open it up to the board. Any, any comments, any, any questions to uh, the area? Great, Steve. So oh, good evening, everybody. Nice to, to see you. And, uh, you know, I think we're all very excited that uh, that you're here tonight. Uh, you know, the only, uh, you know, I know Maggie, I've met Maggie before. Senti, I know from the farmer's market, he's been a vendor at the farmer's market for, for a number of years now. And, uh, uh, but how does, how does one become a member of area? What, uh, what information can you relate to the uh, to the community to become I'm not a member I want to become a member and how can my wife and I join oh uh, well there's a hundred dollar fee oh well actually it's free good news is it's free for anybody to join <laughs> that was a lot good one <laughs> simply go to our website um, you can choose to sign up for um, our mailing list and that automatically puts you in, onto our mailing list and you'll be able to receive um, updates on our meetings, our Zoom meetings. Um, uh, we also send out uh, various announcements when big events happen, uh, for example, celebrating Diwali or uh, cultural events that we feel the community might want to be aware of. Uh, we also are on social whether it's Instagram and Facebook. So it really is an open community <coughs> and the only okay. qualification to join is your interest. Okay, very good. So I'll, I'll go to the, to the website. And, and based on your, your list of proposed activities, uh, one of the things that stands out personally for me because my wife and I are involved in a, in a grassroots organization that, that does cultural programming and that's the your, your cultural events. So uh, I think any any way that we can assist or collaborate on that, I think would be great. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Gali, did you mention our, um, our website, ashanapd.org? Yes, uh, it's www.ashlandequity.org. And if you give me a second, yeah, I'll pull it up. And then Stephen, just to add on, I think um, we're looking for allies and you know um, members of Ashton that can help us spread the word and get our numbers up so that we can promote diversity within the town. Because as I'm sure you've noticed, you know the town keeps getting more diverse. So getting that um, helping hand from various members who might have resources that we might not be able to get will really go a long way in um, furthering the cause. Sure, good good point, Senti, and I think. Uh... I think uh, I think it's fair to speak for everybody that that would be willing to spread that word out and uh, and collaborate in, in whatever way uh, can can move this forward. Exactly. So, Yolanda, have you done, a, uh, Sorry. Have you done a, a show with Area? I did. I interviewed them actually back last spring about, a, yeah, like February, March, we did a Zoom interview to talk about the organization. Nice. I wonder if there's something that we do, like, like maybe a follow-up to see whether, where they are now compared to where they were when you first started, uh, first had that interview, and maybe you can promote some more activity and, and, and assistance for them that way as well. Well, I, I, what I would say is, you know, the next time they have a big event or a big push, we could do something at that point and, you know, talk about what they're doing. Do you folks have anything planned right now uh, in the future that we could uh, at least help promote right now? Any, any cultural event that, that you have coming up uh, in the near future? Uh, we don't have the event planned as, mo as at the moment. That's what we are trying to set up. Uh, we've been active for a little over a year and uh, we have this momentum going and we really are at a point where like say think of ourselves as a startup company we need to take to take the next step uh, we need some resources to you know put up an event 
or cultural event because um, yeah, these things unfortunately, or fortunately, unfortunately, uh, need funding and need money, and we can only do so much as a group. We it is a volunteer-led organization. Uh, many, if not all, of us on the board are parents, just like many of you, and we do just sacrifice uh, some time outside our busy schedules to uh, make time for it. So it, it really is. Uh, really challenging to keep it going without uh, soliciting help or funds to put on events like that. So we really want to do this. Uh, we just need, you know, a little support and a little help. Yeah, uh, I would Mr. have Chair? to say. Oh, oh. Go, ahead. <laughs> just to, go ahead. Sorry, just to follow up on what Alan said. Um, so one of our primary goals is to become a 501c3 status just to give us the opportunity to apply for various grants that deal with diversity and inclu inclusion out there. And so we're hoping that by becoming that, we'll be able to do more activities with the community and also be able to collaborate with other organizations within the town. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Go ahead, Rob. Well, I was just gonna um, suggest, and you probably already, I mean, uh, what a good place I think for collaboration is Ashland is, is united and being in touch with those folks and maybe looking at ways of uh, working with them or help have, having them help you spread the word about your mission. I would say, have you been involved with, uh, do you know those folks Ashland is united and worked with them yet or? Yes, I'm actually a member and I've attended a few meetings with them. So next year we'll probably okay. do more collabs with the different um, groups within the town and, and promote um, BNI. Yeah, I think there's some, you know, potentials like the uh, <laughs> cultural council, as Steve mentioned, I think would be very helpful. Mm. Um, and I would, you know, I guess, so did, it's, it seems like you folks are, are requesting funds and I, and I think we did discuss it. I don't know, Steve, did, was this something we were thinking about for our uh, fund or? Yeah, what's, so, what's our thinking on that? So uh, area had uh, provided a request to the board uh, for funding uh, for your 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 list, and uh, it happens to coincide with our normal uh, BAA grant program. And so uh, Rob and I serve on a subcommittee that reviews the the applications and then reports back to the to the full board so that that uh, application that you've submitted we will re be reviewing probably next week we'll have we'll have a sizable list of, of grant applications so uh, and it's something Rob I think it'll be uh, we will probably vote on at our December the 8th meeting so which is you know just a few weeks away and uh, you know Fairly confident that uh, you'll 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 get some funding from our grant program. Sounds good. One other question I have, if I can just uh, uh, ask, I know you, one of your big fo focuses uh, obviously is the school system. How about the public library? Any any uh, synergy with the public library system as well? Yeah, that's also on our plans, but you know, as a group of a new group, there's only so much we can do in such a short time. We've only been around for about a year, but we're open to working with you know all all groups and organizations in Ashland. Um, and right now, at least, we started with with the schools, and we know that the teachers, some teachers, might need some books, and we're trying to see how we can collaborate with. Uh, other local groups to make that happen for them. So, so Steve, do, do you have a contact for the library? Because I know that we've given the um, public school some, you know, books that they can add to the curriculum. So, you know, we can, um, they can talk about something besides what's on the curriculum. So do you have something we can talk to the library, maybe provide some book references that they can add to their collection? Yeah, actually, I happen to li live with the chair of the library trustees, so I could probably mention it to her. <laughs> that would be amazing. And, and our, our new library director, Mina, 
is very open to working with different groups in the community. And she, the, the public library is currently doing a survey looking for people's input. So you might wanna get that. And I think you guys might've shared the survey already in one of your Facebook posts or in your email. So I think it's great to make sure that as things like that come up, you're getting as many people involved and giving their feedback on what's going on in town as possible. Have you also been in contact of uh, working with uh, Beth Reynolds, uh, who is our uh, economic development uh, director, um, and along with like the, uh, the friend, along with the ABA, uh, <laughs> considering that you know POC businesses and you know the National Business Association, uh, you should be working you know coincide with one another type of deal. Yes, so I'm a member of the ABA, and I meet with um with Adam and the team yep. and then with yep. Beth with the different and you know even like helping out upper cuts you know we met with with Beth and we met with um the chief breaks as well so we've been in contact with them and they're trying to help us out as best they can and going back and forth with that well that's good I think that's uh it's a good start yeah I mean you folks have got a great start and like anything else I mean I I, I can tell you that you know it the wills of progress move slowly but as long as they're moving, that's a good thing. So just, I have, you know, I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm impressed with um, just your focus and the mission that you've put forward and, and how you've been able to make um, some major, major changes in this community in just a short amount of time. Um, you know, I, I think about like, you know, we, we as, a, as a leadership team need to, need to do more to look at things from a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. I think that we, um, you know, I know you've, you've done a lot with the school system, but I think uh, as, a, as a town, we need to do more. Um, so it's, it's, it'll be interesting. I, I wanna, you know, I've been able to attend a few of the, the area meetings, but, um, you know, any way that we can help advocate and, um, and, and, and be a partner to you. I think that's, that's what we, we would really like to, to be able to do. We've had, we uh, had a retreat a couple of weeks ago and we talked about anti-racism and really moving towards, um, you know, I mean, Ashland's a diverse community and we, we strive to be inclusive, but it's, it's like, we, we need to do more than just talk the talk. We need to walk the walk. So, um, I think that there's definitely some progress that 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 um, that we can help move forward as well from a board perspective. So uh, I just want to thank you for all the work that you've done so far because it's been for a group of volunteers that have, that started only a year plus ago and are now over a hundred members. You guys are doing great things. So um, thank you for all the work that you're doing. Yeah, thanks, Brandy. And then kudos to the town because I mean, like when we contact, you know, Mike Herbert and even Beth or the school system, like they really are receptive. I mean, we all came from different towns, different parts of the world. But then when we came to Ashland, we noticed that the town has been very welcoming. And you know, when we have requests, they meet with us. They take time out of their schedules to meet and help us as they, as best they can. So it's been really great working with the town as a whole. That, that that's good to hear. Yeah, we so, very, uh, thank, thank you guys so much. We just want to thank you guys so much for taking the time and, you know, uh, trying to work and to initiate these relationships and uh, to move uh, our initiatives forward. So we do appreciate that. Thank you, Shay. It was donation, nice. Donation checks can be made out to area? Yes. Yes, definitely. Yes, they, yeah, you can make it out to area or even just the full name, but area we have a, a, a count in town okay good thank you great yolanda i have to say it was nice to see mr adams put out a call for volunteers for the principal search at the mendez school uh, principal bennett is retiring at the end of the year and it was nice to see that they are um, going to have a member of your community of your committee as part of the search i think that's a great first step and that'll be very helpful in the search for that new principal there Absolutely. And just yep. one other thing too, Michael is going to lay out the process for our police chief search. Um, and, you know, we want to formally invite you to kind of be a part of that process because I think it's important to make sure uh, all voices are heard and not just uh, assume that people know about it, but really 
invite you to, to be um, an active participant in the, in the process because it's, it's important work. Make sure you fill out the surveys if you haven't done it yet. Either. It's on the uh, town website because any and all information is very, is, is vital to, uh, you know, a complete search. So we appreciate that. And uh, I, I'd like to thank you all for being here. I uh, appreciate the presentation. It was great. Ray, do you have anything you'd like to add? You just, you, 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 you're sitting there just looking handsome. You know, you haven't said no, anything. You, no, you're, you're I, good? <laughs> I, I'm good. I, I think I, I agree with well, a lot of what my, uh, my fellow members shared and, uh, Steve, I, I really appreciate you showing interest in becoming a member and we invite you actually, if you, if it's not, it's not too late because we have actually well, a meeting tomorrow at 6.30. If you have time, we have a monthly meeting, which might be the last one for the year. So if you can attend that, uh, we do appreciate all kinds of ideas. I appreciate you bringing up the public library. We're definitely going to look into that and see how we can, you know, coordinate with them and work with them. So thank you guys for having us. Hey, thank you, Ray. Thank you, you know, I'll the meeting tomorrow, but you know, I, uh, as I mentioned, my wife and I will certainly uh, uh, plan. I made a note already to join area tomorrow. So appreciate that. And looking Mike, forward Mike, to it. Mike, raise his hand. Oh yeah. Good, Michael. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, I just really wanted to say, um, you know, what a great job you guys are doing. Um, I've really liked getting to know you all as individuals and uh, also as an organization and appreciate the partnership and again, developing that relationship going forward. Um, I've really liked the opportunity to, to get counsel from you on a number of different matters over the past year. It's been very, very helpful for me. And uh, you're certainly going to be included as part of our police chief process. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate the kind words, everyone. And uh, just to sum up what uh, everyone has said, we have a young organization, a grassroots organization, um, barely a year old, and we're riding the momentum and the interest of the Zeitgeist around the country. Um, but we're at a critical stage where there's a op there might be, uh, unfortunately, interest might fade now that elections are over. So we need to keep that momentum going and, uh, uh, you know, keep Ashland at the forefront of uh, these issues. It's a great town and has a great potential to be very inclusive and very open to uh, more people of color to move to Ashland. Well, it makes it great for people like yourselves that are doing the job that needs to get done. And we right. appreciate that. So thank you all very much. We appreciate all your time and your effort. Uh, yes. wish you all Thanks very, having us. Happy Thanksgiving to you all and you and your families. Thank you again. And right. uh, Alan, I'll, shoot, I'll see you uh, next week. Yep. See you in the next meeting. In the next meeting. Right. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Oh, we're up to old new business. You know, Tell I me. met. I noticed we don't have a consent agenda tonight. That's amazing. No, I said that earlier. I, I made that. I made that comment earlier. I must have been on you. Well, <laughs> we could make it all a consent agenda if you wanted to right now. <laughs> Thank you. Is that, is that a motion? <laughs> <laughs> just joking. Do you want me to just jump into it, Joe? <clears throat> Go right ahead if you would, Michael, please. Okay. So uh, just to give a preview to everyone um, watching at home and, and the board. So we are going to have town meeting again on December 1st, starting at 7 p.m. in the high school. Uh, we will, again, there's just a few articles on the warrant. Um, the warrant has been posted, should be made available. Um, for everyone to see if they are interested. Uh, we will be having a town meeting forum on Monday, the 29th. Uh, don't have a time exactly, but I could say it's probably going to be 6.30 p.m., but I just need to nail that down and make sure that um, WACA is able to do that. So Will that's that going to be virtual. Be... Uh, that'll be Zoom, Michael. It will be virtual. Um, again, it's an opportunity for everyone who has questions about the warrant 
and some of the articles on the warrant to uh, hopefully get those questions answered. And uh, I'm hoping to have somebody from sustainability there as well as the community preservation committee. So that's, uh, that is that. Michael, with, with respect to that, um, has, uh, the, will there be any presentations then uh, at the beginning of town meeting? No, there won't. There will not be. I can't okay. speak right now because I know there um, were some concerns about that. Um, there will not be. I do need to meet with Adam and Ash to just kind of work out um, how to move forward with that last article. Okay. All right. Thank you. Michael, are we going through the um, the warrant articles at town meeting, or are we, are we introducing them? What What's your thoughts? Most of them are, are either like, uh, you know, Brittany or um, or CPC. There's, and I would assume Article Eight, you would want to have the Sustainability Committee. Is there? Are there any that you would like to take the lead on and jump into it? I, I no, not really. <laughs> not <Okay>. really. <laughs> but I, but I'm happy to help if if if. You know, if you need somebody to, to, to take. I know we've been sort of transitioning more that, you know, if it's budget, Brid Brittany's been doing it, you know, like the I and I stuff, you've been doing it. So yeah. either way. I, I volunteer to do the free cash transfer. I've got some ideas I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, if I hear those four, those uh, four words together. Which, <laughs> you know which, which four, four words? Upper Child's Trail. Trail. <laughs> no, I was thinking of other things. Anyway, oh. I was just kidding about that. I know. I'm looking <laughs> forward to see what the free cash is. Yeah. Um, I'm Eli, looking forward to it too, Rob. Rob. And yep. just, when will we have that number, Michael? I'm hoping to have it by the end of the week. So we did okay. get notification from DOR that, you know, the person who is, for lack of a better term, our account rep has moved it forward to her boss, who is the okay. final sign off on that. So I, okay. I, I do hope that we have it this week. We will have a FinCom meeting, I believe, next week. Um, and again, we're really hoping to have it before that FinCom meeting. Okay. So, while you, while we, you're we're not going through the warrant articles tonight, are we? We're just, you just talked about it. Yeah. <laughs> no, the only thing I would note, you know, we got that email about article five and concern about the legal stuff. So I would just hope that we make sure we get that all straightened out by the time we get to town meeting. So there's no long discussion well, the, about the that. current current sponsor is cpc on the warrant all right so whether it's you know you know town council i just want to make sure that we've got that straightened out um and yeah rob i think um I, I would agree with you it would be best to just go ahead and get a, a clarification on that now as sure. opposed to trying to go yeah. through the town meeting right correct yeah. okay um moving on to the boston marathon update uh it was provided as part of your packet, um, a the, big, the, the thing time, that says confidential and big letters. Yeah, at, at the time it was embargoed and, and confidential, but uh, obviously it's it's not anymore. Um, so the BAA is they're happy, and I think we're all happy uh, to move this back to a Patriots Day uh, or the marathon on Patriots Day. So it's going to be held April eighteenth, twenty twenty two. And the BAA has established a field of 30,000 participants this year. Um, and all athletes must be vaccinated and show proof uh, to be able to participate in the race. Um, and they'll need to provide, um, you know, proof of vaccination. So uh, again, looking forward to that, but just wanted to give everybody a, a notification of that, what the date is um, and what the field size is gonna be this year. And we know that um, the town will receive bid numbers for for runners. We'll use we'll usually get it on. Our, I'm expecting to get it on our standard time period, which um, right now it escapes me. But uh, we'll have it well in advance, so we'll do the same process as we usually do uh, with the bids. Okay. okay. Um, next item is uh, I've included as part of your packet um, a notice of filing and public hearing from the Department of Public Utilities. 
So this is related to Eversource's uh, three-year sustainability plan that they have filed with the DPU. Um, it's docketed at, uh, as DPU 21-121. So that would be the full plan. Um, in it, they're, they're, talking, they're going to talk about some of their sustainability practices over the next three years and some of their sustainability programs and what they're looking at doing. Um, they uh, do anticipate going up or people will see um, an increase in their rate. So the residential heating customer, um, so let's just say they use 132 therms per month. They would experience a monthly peak bill increase of uh, six cents for 21 and 22. They would be looking at a decrease on the same average of uh, $4.52 in 2022 slash 2023, and a monthly uh, peak bill increase of $2.11 in 2023, 2024. Again, that's just for a residential heating customer. So if you, if you want to look at the plan um, and you have comments and questions about it, they will be holding, meaning the DPU will be holding a video conference um, on December 1st, beginning at 7 p.m., and December 2nd, beginning at 2 p.m., and the web addresses can be found on the filing. And then also anybody who wants to, if you don't want to do that, uh, you also are able to provide comment to DPU um, on the company's filing by submitting written comments to the department uh, no later than 5 p.m. on Friday, December 3rd. So. Um, so if you have, Rob, I, I think you'd probably be especially interested in that and looking at their sustainability plan. So I, I have not looked at it myself, but just wanted to give everybody notice that it has been filed and you have an opportunity to provide comment. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Michael. You know, I saw that as well. And um, it's been, um, if I, it's been kind of a big deal, the utilities company's three-year plan, and there's been a number of of discussions about it. I think as, as lay people, we're kind of limited in our ability to see this and impact it. But uh, I know there was some issues about their energy efficiency work and um, you know how much ground source heat pumps, how many heat pumps they're doing versus uh, gas systems and, and you know some controversies, but um, a lot there to absorb. Um, but uh, you know, thanks for bringing that up and posting it. I think it is an important uh, you know, an important but complicated uh, regulatory pr um, procedure they're going through now. And it was, you know, I, it, it, um, we're involved in my company. We do a lot of weatherization work and, and, and uh, heating system replacements. And this was a big, uh, it was a big question of what kind of incentives they were putting in and how far they're pushing towards renewable energy versus staying with gas systems. I mean, this, this plan is, is um, I think, you know, is really to, um, uh, has a lot of incentives for ending oil, oil, of course, and coal. And then the question has been how much towards ending gas. But, you know, so those are all the kinds of things that have been going on. But, yeah, a lot, a lot to uh, look at there. Yeah, great. Um, so I'll move along to the American Rescue Plan funds, and I'm going to share my screen and give you our latest, um, our latest plan here. So this reflects the discussion we had a couple of Saturdays ago about the uh, how we plan on using the American Rescue Plan funds. I have it, American Rescue Act, up here. Um, so initially, we had broken funding down for sidewalks into two specific sidewalks. Um, that would be 135 between the mobile and community center, uh, roughly between the mobile and community center. And then also on High Street from the bridge near the train station up to Wilbur, and that connects to um, a network of sidewalks up there. And so what the board decided to do is kind of lump all of those together, number one. So that's a total of $625,000. And then we will also look at the possibility of doing a multimodal path as opposed to uh, just a, a sidewalk on those, right. on those as well. And, Michael, um, will that, yes. 
So that incorporate Michael also. We talked about the the need for a cross uh, crossover. Yes. Cross walk. On one thirty five, correct? One thirty five, correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It will incorporate that. It will I just want to suggest that my minutes are excellent source of notes for this discussion. They're really good, Rob. <laughs> they are. Um, I uh, so we have two point four million earmarked for downtown enhancements. Um, again, this is probably the one I could find the most rationale for. Uh, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to use that money instead of other funds that were earmarked for that, which would then free up some unrestricted funds to do some of the other things that we would like to do. Um, I do have the two turf field replacements on here for the middle and high school uh, at half a million each. Um, in the notes, uh, you'll see that uh, I've put in there the reflect, reflecting our discussion that we'll have discussions with the schools about that before um, it moves forward. Do have seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars earmarked for the Valentine Barn, and we don't anticipate that is um, enough to do uh, some of the things that we want to do. But we will be looking at making up funding with uh, with other sources. And then finally, we've got half a million dollars earmarked for open space acquisition to, uh, um, and we haven't designated a parcel or parcels for that yet. So that again, totals 5.3 million. I do, related to this, um, I do want to bring up the um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was recently signed by President Biden, because, and the reason I'm bringing this up is I think as we were going through this process, we realized there were a lot of things that we wanted to do and, and want to try to do, especially with infrastructure work. And so, you know, hopefully if we weren't able to address it through American Rescue Plan funds, we would be able to do it through this new infrastructure act. And uh, just, I don't know if anybody's received any correspondence related to this, but um, based on the funding formula, uh, that Treasury is utilizing, Massachusetts would expect to receive $4.2 billion for uh, federal aid highway apportion programs, and then and also $1.1 billion for uh, bridge replacement and repairs, which as we're about, we'll talk about later in this meeting is going to be very, very important. Um, it also increases investment in public transportation as well, and Massachusetts is expected to uh, get 2.5 billion for that. Um, there's some other things uh, I do want to point out. There's also a competitive uh, 12.5 billion dollar bridge investment program um, that Massachusetts can compete for. So hopefully uh, we will see some of that money flow down into Ashland and uh, do some of the infrastructure work that we're talking about. Unfortunately, and they're talking about um, spending I don't know how many billions on replacing the two bridges to the Cape. So. We'll see what actually yeah. gets done. It's a, it's a lot of money. Um, yeah. So uh, with that, we the board didn't actually vote on uh, this plan on Saturday. Um, I would ask the board if they would vote to endorse this plan. Michael, before, before we do that, if you don't mind, could you talk a little bit, you know, we've been talking about the funds for downtown and how you've been shifting money around. And now we're seeing, you know, a big chunk here. Can you talk about, you know, you, you, see, you keep saying it'll free up funds to do other things. Can you give a little more background for that? I mean, I think most of us understand, but maybe the public that's watching and listening doesn't quite understand, okay, you know, because we had the money to do the downtown and now we're shifting the funds that we're using. So what other things will we be able to do with those other funds now? Well, so I'll, I can think of two sources right off the bat. Um, the, the I and I funding that we had for Campanelli and Thorndike, and that would be, um, upon a vote of the board, we could repurpose that funding. And then also some of the money that was earmarked or that would be get it, that we would be getting from the UGC development per the development agreement. So those funds are unrestricted funds, again, pending a board vote on the first one. So we can use those for anything. Um, ARPA funds, you have to be able to justify it and you right. have to be able to, to tie it. There needs to be some nexus to COVID or water, sewer and stormwater infrastructure. Right. So, you know, the overall philosophy is if you have, let's say, one 
thing that uh, that or two things that you need to do, and you have two buckets of money, and one is restricted to maybe you know do the first thing, and the second is unrestricted. You know, you, you want to use the restricted funds for the thing for that piece of work and for that specific thing, right? Exactly, and then use the unrestricted okay. funds for the other things. So that is the overall plan. Okay. Um, and then the second question that I had in regards to the turf field replacements, you know, as, as many people know, with the discussion when we did these, and, and this is out still out for a number of years, it's not happening next year. Um, and I would, I would recommend that we stagger it so that both fields aren't offline at the same time. Um, you know, I would trust that, that, you know, public works would be able to manage that. But, you know, it was said that, you know, we were going to have programs in place for revenue that would allow us to put money aside to be able to replace these fields. So, and, and again, we had a conversation as to why that didn't happen, but can you, you know, let the public know as to what happened <laughs> that we don't have those funds? Yeah. Because a number of things did happen. I, I would agree. And I would actually put them into three categories. So the first one is actually the, uh, the professionalization of the um, enterprise fund in the department and having DPW officially take it over from the fields management group that we had. The fields management group was a great resource for us and they were able to accomplish a lot of things. Um, but we found that you know some of the methodologies that they utilized uh, would open up the town to a certain liability. Um, and that wasn't necessarily my decision. Um, that was, you know, one of my predecessors' decision to move in that direction. Um, and it's something I would support. So the costs have increased a bit, um, more than what we had anticipated. Uh, second, the revenues just haven't materialized the way that they were presented. So I think when this was first presented to town meeting as a plan, um, I'm not necessarily sure if there was consideration given to uh, competition from other communities uh, down the line. And I think shortly after um, we opened ours, uh, our fields, Marlboro um, decided they were going to, to make, you know, a couple of complexes and devote actually their meals tax funding or hotel tax, I should say, towards developing field programs and given its location right at the juncture of 495 and 90, it was, um, you know, obviously that gets a lot of, a lot of use. So, or actually I'll have four points. The third one is we actually see schools and youth organizations using this a lot. So it doesn't necessarily provide us the opportunity to have rentals and to generate that revenue. And then lastly, uh, we've just had a double whammy over the last couple of years. Um, first of all, we had Triple E, which greatly impacted um, our ability to do programs and rent the fields because people didn't want to go outside. They were staying inside. And then obviously the pandemic has, has made an impact on revenues as well. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Rob. Um, yeah, just, um, so one of the things, Michael, so the, the new infrastructure uh, funding when it comes through, is that going to, are you going to be able to use that for open space? The infrastructure funding? No. You know, I did not see, I did not see anything specifically. Yeah, that would be, yeah, that might be a bit of a stretch. The reason I'm bringing it up is because, you know, it seems to me this turf field would be an infrastructure, I would think, and maybe one of those should be moved to that list and increase you know, open space here. I mean, one of the discussions we had, and you have some of it here, is that, but, uh, you know, I do want to make it clear that I think at least I and maybe others are really think that the schools should also be involved in, in funding that. So, and hopefully, you know, we'll, that'll open up some space in this list because we're using a million dollars of this for turf fields. And, uh, you know, I think that's a lot for this uh five million dollars so so rob um, to your point and this actually ties into um yolanda's previous question as we get more fidelity as to how massachusetts is going to disperse these funds to cities and towns um we may have an opportunity 
to use infrastructure money for some of these things, which would then free them up for other things that we might yeah. want to do. Um, so, I think we just need to see exactly okay. how Massachusetts is going to do this. Well, I'll, all right. I'll support this list with that understanding that we're looking at alternatives and um, this isn't cast in stone here. Correct. So, Michael, I know that when we had our retreat, we had a, a really robust discussion about the public's feedback on the survey um, and, you know, this particular list. Um, just, you know, to recap the, the survey results, do you remember exactly how many people had, had submitted feedback and, and, you know, directionally it lines up with, with this list, correct? Yeah, so I, I believe we had about 80 people do do the survey uh, for some reason that number is sticking sticking in my head um, that the police chief survey number really kind of I'm focused on that one right now but yes this this you know follows follows I, I think the overall intent of what we saw in the survey um, again surveys are just they're just not very very scientific and, you know, there's an ability of maybe one self-selecting group, you know, organizing and advocating um, for one particular thing. And if they get 20 people to, to do that out of 80 people, you know, that might be, you know, it's a quarter of the respondents, but it not, might not necessarily represent a quarter of what the community wants. So, and we talked about this, I think, at the retreat, how we have to be wary about this. And the turf fields is a, is a, was a good example. Michael, is there any time limit or a sunset date for these monies to be utilized? So the plan, so you have to define what you're going to spend it on by 2024. Okay. Um, they have to be expended by 2026. Okay. So if we were to push out, as Yolanda was suggesting, uh, with respect to the uh, turf field replacements, <clears throat> or stagger them, uh, the staggering would have to be before 2026 and not after 2026. Oh, we would lose that funding, correct? Correct. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. Anybody else have any questions or, or comments they would like to make? I mean, I would, I would, I would love to see some of that. You know, <clears throat> Water and sewer uh, infrastructure monies be utilized in, in, in other in other areas in town. Um, maybe purchase more property to uh, put a water treatment facility plant in. Maybe mm -hmm. that's monies we could look at down the road when it comes to uh, the, the federal stuff. monies that that, that are yeah. coming in. You know, um, so I mean, on that note, Joe, it might be time for us to get an update on thoughts about doing our own water treatment plant, right? I mean, I, I know, you know, many years ago, we all thought, okay, we wanted to do that, but I know there's been different thought about that. So it might be time in the new year to, well, to have a discussion you, and see where it's at. Right. Interesting. You bring that up, Yolanda, because that after our traffic and study, uh, traffic study meeting uh, yesterday, uh, Doug Small and I uh, had a conversation about that. And um, he thought that maybe we should look, look, look that again, uh, look into that again. And, um, maybe revisit that whole, that whole idea because the money that we're spending into Framingham, you know, for the, for the fees that we pay Framingham for our water to go and, uh, and sewage to go through, we could actually use that money to uh, pay you off, you know, a bond issue if we had to go something, go, use that well, route. So this, re this reminds me, we're talking about a strategic plan and a comprehensive plan. It's <laughs> important aspects yeah. of that. Right. No, absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. Okay. Joe, so, if I can just add some go, go ahead, Steve. I'm sorry. Yeah, go right ahead. I, I do agree with with Rob in terms of the the financing of the fields. I think that deserves a lot more uh, discussion. I know, Michael, you had on the the sheet uh, that you were going to be collaborating with the school system, and I, I would hope that there would be a shared financial component there. And uh, uh, personally, uh, I don't think. I know right now we've got 500,000 allocated for, for uh, land acquisition. Um, you know, that just seems like such a small amount based on, 
you know, some of the numbers that we've seen or hearing about with different pieces of property. So, uh, you know, I think if we can free up money somewhere uh, to add to that bucket would be a good thing. I, I don't disagree, Mike. I agree, with that, Steve. So I don't disagree with that at all. Um, is this is it now time to uh, ask for a a motion to take a vote on on what Michael presented to us this evening? Are there any more questions or discussions that we need to have? I move that we approve the proposed use of ARPA funds with the understanding that as things go, if we can adjust how some of them are used in future time, we do that. Do I hear a second? I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor, uh, voice vote, please. Reeves, aye. Mitchell, aye. Chair, aye. Mignani, aye. Mignani, aye. So that's five zero. Um, Thank you for all the work, Michael, and thanks for the discussion that we had at our retreat uh, that everybody was involved in. And leads me up to a question. Do we still want to have a liaison meeting? Yes. The school? Yes? Okay. Yes. Certainly for to... that, plus some other things, I think budget-wise. Okay. Michael, you good with that? You know, I've always been open to that. Um, okay. Again, a yep. tri board. That's that's the <coughs> boards. I think you know the other two boards would need well, to that, that, be that I think the question. first is liaison. First is liaison and see. Okay. Yeah, All and right. then a tri board. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Um, so moving on to the next one, the next item on the agenda, um, that is a bench that was donated uh, by the Framingham Rotary Club. So yesterday we had a ceremonial ribbon cutting for a very nice bench that the Framingham Rotary had uh, presented to the town. Uh, Steve was there, Yolanda was there, as well as a number of Rotarians. They're looking at expanding their footprint and doing a little bit more in Ashland. So this was maybe the first step of expanding that relationship. Um, so definitely want to express our thanks to the Framingham Rotary. This bench is one of the benches that we would use downtown, and it's such quality work. Um, you know, it, it's done correctly. There's been a you know, concrete pad that's been poured. It's been bolted on there. Just a really high quality bench. So uh, if it's located next to Ocean House. So if you have an opportunity to go by there, you can see it. And um Enjoy. It's a perfect spot. Looking at the uh, the Riverwalk Bridge, it's just uh, beautiful. And I did pass along the specs. Diane sent me the specs for the uh, for the bench, and I have passed those on to the Ashland Lions as well. So, you know, I know the Lions have have done some some benches in the past, but uh, you know, hopefully, if they do in the future, they'll maintain the the standard. Yeah. So that's good. Um, it's very, it, it's a, it's a great, it's a great amenity in addition to, to town. Do we need to accept this as a gift, Michael? You could officially, if you wanted to, I, I think it is on town property. I originally thought it was going to be more on ocean house. It was on ocean house property, but um, certainly you can, if you would like. I think it would be, uh, you know, I think a good, good form to, to accept it as, as a gift. It's definitely not on, on Ocean House property. So it's clearly in, in Ashland uh, public land. So I would, mm -hmm. I would move that we uh, uh, accept the gift of uh, the bench from the Framingham Rotary uh, with the, the thanks of uh, the Ashland community. I'll second that. Sounds good. Voice vote, please. Greaves, aye. Mitchell, I. Here, I. Vincent, I. Vignani, I. That's 5 0. And again, thank you, the Rotary Club, for uh, thinking of the town and donating that uh, lovely bench. So we're good. We're good. I'm sorry. I, uh, go, but that was yesterday when they had the ceremony yesterday? It was yesterday and it was yes. freezing cold. It was so cold. It was. Um, would you like to move to uh, priority right. project, Mr. Chair? Um, yeah, uh, we're, we're moving right along. Is there any, yeah, we're good to go. Okay. 
Um, the only thing I have <coughs> under the rail transit district is to make sure that everybody um, out in the audience knows about the Trolley Brook Trail rib ribbon cutting that's happening on November 19th. I believe the top course of paving is slated to be poured uh, tomorrow. Um, it's, you know, I was able to go look at it uh, yesterday. It's just going to be an incredible amenity for the town. Um, it's just, you know, when we purchased the rail transit district, this was one of the reasons why we purchased it. And to see that kind of come to fruition and come to life has been really great. So again, it's on Friday the 19th. It starts at 8.30. Um, speaking program starts at 9. We have a number of guests, quite a few guests that are invited. And, um, you know, it's certainly open to the public as well. Michael, and where should people, people park? Um, so we're, we've decided to move it right, Jen, to the Memorial Drive section, right? So there's, you have the ability to park there adjacent to the fields and then where the solar cap or where the solar field is, there's okay. some parking spaces there. We're going to try to have um, event parking signs just to help with that, Yolanda. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think so it's show up is 830 and then but speaking doesn't start till nine. So what's the plan for that half an hour? Um, well, we'll have, you know, we'll have coffee and we'll have okay. um, muffins from the bagel yeah. table. Um, you know, it's an opportunity to mingle and and you know, take a look at the trail and, and, you know, it might be some people's first look at it. Yeah. So, okay. Um, the downtown construction update, actually, Greg, um, kind of stole my thunder a little bit on that. I just wanted to let everybody know we're really, uh, we've really been focusing hard on, um, getting that summer street and main street intersection completed. Uh, before the holidays. So it would cause the least disruption to businesses. So we feel like that's being accomplished. Um, I, you know, I, we had a very interesting week. Um, Bill Montenegro, who has been Montenegro's son and who works for MassDOT, actually reached out to us and, and said that New England Construction Journal, which is the largest trade magazine um, in New England, you know, regarding that, uh, that specific industry wanted to come out and do a story on the downtown project. So you know, we met with them and, and Bill and uh, showed them around. And, you know, it was very, uh, it, it's very DPW centric. So, <laughs> you know, there, there's pictures of, of trenches and um, people pouring concrete, <laughs> and conduit, laying conduit. So that was uh, very, very, very interesting. And it's, uh, it's funny. Um, Bill was telling me that the last time downtown was really had a lot of investment in it was when his dad was doing it and made sure that he had eight inches of asphalt on that, on that street. And it's funny, you know, if you see one of the trenches, you can definitely see it's eight or nine inches. So definitely did it right. So um, moving on to uh, public safety in Mendez School, um, I would actually open it up to, to Jen or Joe or Steve to provide we'll, an update we'll, on that. We'll let Jen start off. Uh, you guys can start. <clears throat> I mean, I think everyone can see the sort of the building is progressing. Um, last, I, I can't remember if at our last meeting we talked about the, the sort of large pour that happened. Um, which is a really big deal with for the crew. Um, I think Joe, you mentioned earlier that they're going to start to sort of close in that building, and we've been able to sort of watch it um, come up from the ground, um, and we'll stop being able to see as much progress. They will be continuing work through the winter, um, but they're obviously going to try to close themselves in and keep everything as weather tight as possible. Um, so still on, still on schedule as of now um, through the spring. Um, they'll work through the winter into the spring, and hopefully we'll be moving in you know, late spring, early summer is what we're still hoping for. Now the geothermal uh, wells have been completed. And yeah. I, was, which is, which I, is, that's incredible. Yeah, it is pretty neat. And, and I actually think we ought to make a motion to, or you ought to make a motion to abandon the mock-up because the building's going to be done before the mock-up's done. 
Ah. You know, it's, it's interesting how many people are have questioned what that is and whether it's going to stay there. And uh, mm. but uh, it's it's not going to stay there. It is a construction mock-up that is utilized by the contractors to uh, display the materials and how they fit together, and then color color orientations as well. So it's just a it's just a guide for the contractors, but. Uh, you know, clearly it's- uh, I'm you know, surprised it's been, at, sorry, I'm surprised at how long it's taken. Just been fascinating. <coughs> to watch oh, yeah. This yeah. Over, That's over why I said the, the building's gonna be done. Well, I was, I was asked if that's gonna be the new bell tower for the, uh, for the uh, fire station, for their, uh, right. for their horn. Hey, great segue, Joe. So speaking of fire stations, you know, uh, we talked the last couple of meetings, I've, I've mentioned we've talked about the, the need for some kind of preparation, some thought process for the existing downtown properties. And, you know, how do we, when do we start thinking about it? When do we start prepping for that and so on? So have you, have you given any more thought to that, Michael? I have Steve. I know, you know, whenever we bring up new projects, I'm like, we'll, we'll get to that one after we finish others, but we have done a little bit of preliminary work. And uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, CPA funds were utilized to replace the floors, I think back in 2003. So from the historic bucket and um, floors of the fire station, floors of the fire station. I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure there's not any restrictions <laughs> associated with that. So, so we are, we are, you know, definitely thinking about it. Good. Not sure exactly and, what we can vote to it. Yeah, particularly from an economic development standpoint, uh, I'm assuming uh, Beth is involved with, uh, you know, maybe doing some preliminary research and uh, what uh, potential there might be. Yes, she's actually running point on this. Okay. For both buildings or just for one? We, we think of them as both. I can tell you, I have not heard, I talked to a lot of people and I've, anytime this issue comes up, nobody talks about keeping the, the police station. Everybody's just ripping I, I, I agree. Yeah. It, it, it's a non-functional building right now. And why, so put, hopefully, why put more money into it? So hopefully we can get some easy consensus around what to do with that. But sometimes even the easy things are hard. So, um, a lot of copper up there. There is, there is. Um, would you, if we're done with public safety, would you like me to move <coughs> to Mendez? I'm ready for you for, to the Mendez. We're good. Okay. So, uh, last Wednesday, we had a pre construction meeting, a, a team meeting with all the department heads and the professional team, as well as the chair of the school building committee, uh, Paul, who I believe he's on here as well. Um, I've provided for you the preliminary logistics plan, as well as the schedule as of today, uh, what that schedule should look like. Um, this is a good opportunity to let the public know um, that work is gonna be starting around November 29th. Um, so some trees will be coming down in order to make way for the fencing that needs to be put up to the safety fencing to make sure that the existing school is separated from um, the site where all the site work's gonna happen. Um, we also are going to be, um, eventually we will be doing some blasting. And so of course, you know, sometimes that would incorporate a pre-blast survey if, if houses and structures were within a certain radius. So correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, but I don't believe we have um, structures within that radius, you know, other than the existing school, but we are expanding it out, um, you know, going beyond what the required radius is, and we'll be doing pre-blast surveys on some houses. Yeah, so the, um, so Michael, the, the, the contract, the subcontractor, site subcontractor has indicated uh, that they will probably still want to uh, be blasting the front uh, side of ledge. So the, the rear behind the school, you're correct, there, there are no structures or even properties within 250 foot radius of that, uh, but there, there may be uh, on the front of the site. 
but uh, to your point, what we're doing is we're going to be uh, extending that offer to uh, all the surrounding neighbors uh, to uh, offer that pre blast survey. Um, Quick question on that, Paul. Like, um, are they going to be doing blasting during school hours or are they going to try to work around the, you know, the school schedule? I think it probably depends on when it's going to happen, but uh, those are all, uh, we're still onboarding the, the site's uh, subcontractor who will then have a blasting subcontractor who will work with the fire department and, and obviously the schools to uh, do it at the right times. Um, I, you know, the, the reality of it is the blasting is probably not anywhere near is going to be as disruptive to people as the mechanical things that are going to go on on site. Uh, I think uh, it's it's those those things are typically not much of an event, uh, but uh, I, I can't answer that right now. It'll be coordinated with the uh, with the blasting subcontractor, the fire department and the schools as to when that is. Uh, I, would I would imagine it'll probably be after school hours. Uh, we know, we do have precedent here in town for blasting happening during school hours when they did the fields up at the high school. And basically you'd hear the siren, you know, you'd hear the horns and the kids knew, you know, they would be told that day if there was blasting. So they were prepared for it from the school's perspective. Yeah, we did with, so Brandy, um, it's, it really is amazing, you know, the blasting technology today and how controlled it is and how, how well they can control it. And uh, the, you know, th there's, a, there's a home right next door to the public safety building where blasting was done all along that, that, that side of the site. And, uh, you know, it's done in small amounts. It's heavily covered. Uh, you, you essentially, as Paul mentioned, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's essentially a non-event the way it's controlled and regulated today. So uh, we've saw, as a matter of fact, before they started uh, site work at the public safety building, they, they, we, were, we, were, we were shown a couple of videos where, and this was done, the videos were, were uh, on a school project where they literally blasted right next to a classroom and all you saw was a little lift of, of the mats. And so, again, it's very controlled, very regulated. And uh, I, again, I think for the most part, it'll be a non-event for, for, for the residents. Yeah, I would agree. Um, moving on to the, uh, to the next the sub item here, um, it's good news. Well, actually all of it's good news, but uh, we are looking at hosting a groundbreaking ceremony on December the 8th at, a, at 11 a.m. on the site. Uh, invite everybody to that, uh, should be a good time. Um, it's a really, really, uh, really great way to com commemorate the occasion and, and the investment that we're making in the schools. So I hope to see all of you there and hope to see members of the public there, that'd be great. Okay, um, moving on to Route 126. Um, so I have a couple of updates. Um, number one, Eversource has completed their work. I, I might have mentioned that at our at our last meeting, but they have done their work, so they're out of the picture, um, which is good. Uh, we're we're dealing with northern construction now, um, and uh, the other thing was. Oh, geez, it completely left my head right now. Um, oh, also, the state is continuing to investigate the uh, drainage issues and uh, taking on that responsibility as well. So we, we, we checked in with them recently, and they're still working on that. Michael, when you said Eversource has completed their work, um, are you referring to the poles and the wire transfers or no? No, remember they were doing the, the gas line underneath? Correct. So we we're tr trying to get them in there uh, before they were trying to work in tandem, essentially, so we wouldn't have to go through and cut it open again. Right. Okay. I just, for the folks out there, I just want to make sure they really, well, they, they can't be done because there's just poles standing up there when you use Eversource. So we should reference the Eversource electrical gas so that way we know. 
<coughs> sorry. Okay. That's okay. Go ahead. Uh, so moving to the Valentine project. Uh, so a couple of different things, a couple of different points there. Um, so first of all, I think I mentioned at our last meeting, the fact that uh, arsenic was uh, detected in some of the soil in certain locations. We did a little bit more refined investigation of where that is. Uh, so that's been provided to you as, as part of a map. Um, unfortunately, we will need to do some remediation of about 35 cubic yards. So we're working with Nobis Engineering on, on developing that plan. And um, we anticipate the work it's probably going to cost around twenty-five thousand um, dollars, so that is uh, that's unfortunate. But um, we'll see what we can we can do with that price. No, it's not uncommon to find arsenic in in an area where orchards were were utilized. Good point, Joe. I I, I really should reiterate uh, the fact that. This doesn't mean the site is totally contaminated or that it provides an imminent danger. Um, like you said, it was used as an orchard in many of the, the fertilizers and pesticides used back in the day did contain arsenic. So you do have uh, levels of arsenic in the soil. Um, again, out of that whole area, we did detect, I think it's really like three hot spots. And then um, only one or two, I believe, you know, that are adjacent to each other that required um, remediation. And remediation, for people who don't know, that essentially means uh, taking soil out, the soil that does have the arsenic out, and replacing it with, uh, with clean soil. So that just remind people that, you know, Warren Woods had a very similar issue, but on a much larger, on a larger scale. So... Um, it's, it's not uncommon. Correct. So I guess my question there is, we wound up not remediating at Warren Woods, if I remember correctly, right? That is correct. So, so why are we remediating here? Because it's a level at a level where we have to remediate. Oh, okay. Yeah, that so was in the email uh, from, yeah, where DP said that it seemed yeah. like we at least those spots reached over a certain level. Yeah, that's that was DEP's plan. And the land usage as well. Well, you know, certainly as we're discussing or having ongoing discussions about how to use that property, one of the things that has consistently been brought up is, you know, using that potentially as an agricultural space or part of it um, and using part of it actually as open space too. Mm -hmm. But um, Mass DEP unfortunately sets uh, sets some of the rules regarding this. This well, it's probably just as well to get get the stuff taken care of. So I don't disagree. Um, and then next with the Valentine um, Estate. So what I've provided to you is a cabling plan. Um, just to remind everybody what what we're hoping to do is to go ahead and cable the barn um, over the winter to ensure that it remains standing. I believe I did provide to you earlier today also a letter from Johnson engineer. Structural Engineering. Yeah, yeah, the structural engineer. Yeah, it's in the in the packet as well. Yeah. Yeah, that talked about um, the, the the fact that maybe the frivolity of uh, of doing the roof, considering some of the, the beams and the, the superstructure there, as well as the foundation. So if we go ahead and cable it, um, we have the opportunity to, again, make sure that the, the structure remains. Um, and then, as we just saw with our ARPA discussion, hopefully put some funds towards that uh, to, to the barn and the renovation of the barn next year. Um, we do plan on that cabling is supposed to happen the first week of December. Um, and it's less than $10,000. I believe it's like 9,200. Michael, so, can I ask you a question? Do you think it'd yeah. be prudent to read the letter um, from JSE so that way um, the factual information is out there instead of people coming up and surmising and using their own you know, opinions as to 
why it's taken so long to do this and that. And I'm just, I just thought that this may answer a lot of questions and put a lot of things to bed before, you know, you know what, you know what, Joe, I, I don't think it's going to change the minds of some people, but I can certainly highlight some relevant sections. If if you would, I think, and let's make sure it gets put up on the website. Absolutely. Right. So people can go and see all the information. That's good. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can certainly, you know, highlight some of the. I just, I just think it's important enough. You know, I I read it over twice and I'm saying to myself, my goodness, this will put things to bed. Hopefully it may not, but at the same token, those that don't know now provided the right information. Please give me one second. Again, I won't read the whole um, the whole memo, um, but it does say some of the obvious the existing barn is a wood frame structure. The left rear corner of the barn structure is collapsing. Uh, multiple areas where the existing floor structure is in poor condition. Uh, many floors and roof beams require substantial reinforcement, and really a majority of the existing superstructure is damp um, or has some water damage. So it's the opinion of the engineer that the existing foundation should be demolished and the new reinforced concrete foundation constructed. Um, you know, prior to constructing the new foundation, the existing uh, barn superstructure will need to be repaired, reinforced, and temporarily shored. Um, the first step to that would be to remove the existing roof sheeting. I won't necessarily go into all of that. After the repair and reinforcing work is completed, the exterior wall sheathing can be removed. Uh, the building structure can then be temporarily shored, existing foundation demolished, and new reinforced crown foundation constructed. Um, there was... That, that's a little different than the letter we have in our... I was about to say this is um, this is a this is more detailed about the long term. This the, the one in our packet is more about what needs to be done now in terms of winter. I'm sorry, you're right. Um, I I pulled up the wrong one. I apologize. Uh, so this one states the roof structure is in very poor condition. Roof framing members have had extended exposure to moisture. The roof framing members appear to be waterlogged and have mold growing on them. All work to the existing roof structure should be performed by lifts uh, in order to prevent anyone from walking on the roof. Multiple locations in the existing timber frame where the wood pegs that hold the timbers miss, timber members together are missing. Um, so those can be replaced as well. Uh, the installation of wood pegs at all missing locations needs to be one of the first actions to take. So I, in, in, my pre, in the previous memo, I talked about the foundation. So hopefully this provides a little bit of, inf- this provides some information and some background as to why we're taking the course that we are. Um, and I, you know, I do want to point out that, that this board um, has, you know, committed to investing funds, public funds into this property to help, you know, help it realize its potential. So, and so where, where is it, where are we at with the restriction working group in regards to, a, you know, what restrictions and trying to decide, you know, once we put all this money into this barn, what we're actually going to do with this property? Because, you know, we still don't have that. And I think as we talk about spending more money to resurrect the barn and preserve the barn and, and I think people are supportive of that. There's also still that question of what can we do and when are we going to do something? That's that's the key. That's a, it's the key question. And uh, you know, it's so where we're at with the subcommittee is that uh, a draft has been provided to town council, uh, who is going to review it uh, for legal language. Uh, what we tried to do, uh, Brandy and I, um, is to uh, 
craft language that was as uh, broadly based and as uh, it gave the town the ability to use it for many, many purposes. And, and it really, it's not my list, it's not Brandy's list, it's the community's list. This is the input that we, we received way back when we, when we first bought the property. So, right. uh, so Lisa, Lisa is reviewing that. Uh, and then what we will do is when she brings it back to us, we'll, we'll come to the board, we'll present it, we'll discuss it. And then at that point, uh, we will uh, send it back to Lisa, who will work with the uh, EEA, the, the state agency that oversees the restrictions, and we'll go through that process. But, you know, I think another key piece of this is um, we need to make, uh, at least have a discussion, if not make a decision uh, in terms of the limitations that have been put on this property based on the Article 97 designation. And, um, you know, we've, we've talked about this in the past. It, it prevents the town from selling it, prevents the town from going into a long-term lease arrangement. And, you know, so it really puts limits on uh, how we can go out into the uh, into the, the business community and possibly get partners to, to participate. Otherwise, all of this is going to be on the town's dime. And, and at this point, you know, I, we don't have any numbers. We would be estimating what, what something like this would cost. But that's, that's, that's down the road. I think what we do need to have a conversation about is whether the restrictions that are part of the CPA component provides sufficient protection for the land? And do we actually need the Article 97 designation as well? So uh, Lisa's opinion is that that's something we, we probably want to work through first before we work through all the restrictions uh, and the, through, through the restriction document. So, uh, you know, it's that to me sounds like a broader community. I mean, I think we need to have that discussion, but that's a broader community discussion, right? I mean, absolutely, because it requires in order to remove the Article 97 designation, it's, 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 a, it's a high bar. You need right. uh, CONCOM uh, approval. You need town meeting approval. You need the legislature to uh, vote and support that. Plus, if you take this piece of property out of the designation, you've got to provide another piece to place in that designation. So it's, oh, wow. it's an involved process. And, uh, but again, I think it's deserving, whichever way it goes, it deserves a conversation. And I agree, Yolanda, it deserves a community-wide uh, uh, discussion and, uh, you know, an engagement with the folks that pay for this. And then, uh, you know, Hold on, Rob. Well, I have one more comment. And then, um, you know, the other discussion is we have this committee that we know, you know, part, some of them are engaged and they've been participating in the restriction discussion. You know, do we want to re-engage that group? Do we want to do something with them? You know, are they part of the public discussion? Um, you know, just something to think about. We don't have to, you know, make any decisions or discussion of that, but just something to think about that we have this committee that I, like I said, I think some of them have been involved in your restriction discussion, um, but are we gonna use them for something else? And that's uh, all I, I have think it's important. Yeah, I think it's important that we do include them. They've invested a lot of time and work yeah. and energy in this process. And I think it's important to include them. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it's important to include, uh, you know, uh, as many community members as, as we can. Right, uh, right, you know. okay. But Thank to you. that point, if, if we decide not to go down the road of removing the Article 97 designation, it's really putting the onus back on the community to basically um, support paying for the renovations that would need that be happening on our dime. So, right. you know, because we've earmarked $750,000, there's some CPA funds as well that, that came from town meeting, but we all know that that's not going to cover the, the costs to renovating 
this property and to properly restore it. And so it's, so it really is a community discussion and people have to weigh it. Are they willing to, are they willing to pay a few more million to, to see it come to its full potential or will they support and help, um, help communicate that we need to, to move forward with removing article 97. And that's, that is, it's a big discussion. Yeah. Right. Okay. And Yolanda, to, to go to the, the question uh, as well, it's, uh, you know, there are models out there where communities own properties that they manage. And right. there are many different circumstances, you know, uh, you look at the Thayer Homestead in, in Midway. Yeah. Uh, town owns it, the town operates it. They purchased it for very short dollars. <laughs> and I think it was a dollar. <laughs> and then invested into it. Our situation right. is a little it's different, different, but yeah. again, that's a community decision to make. Right. Uh, but there are models out there where the town owns the property, the town hires a management company or whatever, whatever it might be. So, right. you know, it's, it's a big discussion. Okay, uh, thank you. Just, I just wanted to clarify, but uh, so Steve, you and Brandy, the, the restrictions that we're gonna see, are we gonna see them shortly? And does, uh, would they comply with the article 97 requirements or? They will at this point, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it, 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 the land has the designation on it. So all the restrictions would need to, all the oh, language right. would need to reflect that. So <laughs> I have no idea when it will come back. I think at this point with all the holidays, I, I oh, would but, think, you know, some fairly soon, though. I mean, it's not, I, they're not talking. I, I okay. would say so. Hey, Michael, one more thing I'd like to comment on. And I just know that uh, our building commissioner, Doug Scott, was was very integral to this whole process with the structural engineer and, and the whole review of the of the property. So I just wanted to thank him for his his efforts on this. Yeah, he's um, he's put a lot of work into this. Um, you know, I don't know if if the rest of the board knows this, but he oh. used to restore timber, timber frame uh, barns. And so he has, he has some experience with this. Um, oh. So he's been great. Thanks for acknowledging that, Steve. Yeah. I have, I just have one question and it maybe can't get answered tonight, but I, we've been talking about what to do with the barn and knowing that things needed to get fixed. I it feels, odd to me that now at this point we're talking about cabling it to save it when we've spent money on the roof we've you know we did the article at town meeting in june for the foundation and the roof and i feel like we went back we did it backwards right like why you know i mean we all supported the article because we want to see the barn saved but did we not get dug in there to look at it and the cabling wasn't thought of at that point or no, I mean, I mean, I the only one who feels like we've been like throwing, I don't know. Well, we haven't really spent just, any of the money from June. Um, no, no, I, I think, know that. I know we haven't spent it, but I just like, like that article got put forward by some people and it was like, okay, we want to save the barn. We need to do a roof and a foundation. And then as we started getting into it more, then it was like, oh, well, we can't put the weight of a new roof because of these other things. And we can't do the found, you know. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I think some uh, well-meaning uh, people, um, you know, did some investigatory work and yeah. certainly worked hard to get some quotes uh, for uh, the roof and not necessarily the foundation. Yeah. And uh, to be perfectly frank, I encouraged that. Um, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean, mean that those were, uh, you know, the exact, um, the exact, uh, the things that happened, right. but, you know, I, I, I guess I would say, you know, we didn't have an opportunity or we didn't think of, of Doug at the time of utilizing somebody of Doug's talents or his, his network, I should say, right. um, to come in and look at that. And so, you know, I think it, it underscores how important it is to have really competent professional staff to do this. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's not the ideal way to have done it, but I think the important point is that, you know, everybody's trying to work towards the same goal here. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there seems to be some broad consensus among 
you know, various stakeholders, people who have, who have um, a lot of interest in this property to do this cabling plan and then, you know, basically break it down, you know, and piece by piece and then do a foundation. And then and put then it back together. Utilizing it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so that's all I have on our priority projects. Would you like me to move right to the town manager report? You're on a roll. Keep going. Okay. I do have a couple of things um, in addition to what is on here. So, but first I, I want to congratulate everybody for a very, very successful COVID clinic that was uh, put on at Ashland High School. I was not expecting the production that I saw when I went there, but it was um, it was unbelievable. We had Captain America. We had some cartoons set up. Uh, there were a number of comfort dogs there. And, you know, at first I was kind of like, you know, are they, is that really going to make an impact or is that just for show? But some of these kids had a really, really hard time with, with shots and they were vocal about it. Let's put it that way. But those <laughs> therapy dogs came over and um, it was amazing just to watch them settle down. It was really great. Um, obviously, I'd like to thank um, Ed Berman uh, for all the work that he did putting it together wow. here. But our Board of Health, there were so many volunteers. Um, you know, the town of Holliston was a part of this. Um, our school nurses, um, you know, some of our community members in town that are nurses. We had people from Milford Regional. We had people from Metro West Health Center. Um, it was just really impressive. And as a result, over 600 kids got, uh, got vaccinated. That's awesome. So I talked to, That's Ed, great. Uh, I talked to Ed today, and uh, he was saying that the original allocation of vaccines were, was half of what uh, he was projecting for for the need to vaccinate and that there was uh, the ability to reach out to the collaboration to the, uh, to the regional group and it was able to backfill with the additional, uh, the additional number of vaccines, Michael? Can you say that again, Steve, I'm sorry. So I understand that he, you know, the initial allocation to Ashland was limited, but he was able to backfill uh, for the for the total amount that uh, that he was anticipating through the regional collaborative, yeah, he has not shared that with me, um, so I, I really can't comment on it. Yeah, um, yeah, well, that's he, what he said today, and uh, it's uh, uh, you know again, I think it it goes to uh, I think a lot of the collaboration that's that's really gone on during during COVID, and you know we've talked about regionalization how many years have we all talked about regionalization and uh, yep. it, for, unfortunately it took a pandemic for mm. you know really uh, a, a major uh, you know step forward with that yeah it is it is a great collaboration it has uh, certainly been a successful one um, just the fact that it is a collaboration between communities I feel like has opened up doors that have been closed to other communities. Um, so Lizzie, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I saw Ed at the the veterans event on Monday, and he was saying that <laughs> he has now been reached out to by by other people in the state to say, "How did you go through almost 600 vaccinations in what, like three hours or something?" Um, and so I said, "Ed, you know, you can you can write this up as a as a handbook and how to do stuff." Um, because I think it's important to make sure that more people can get the shots when they need it like this. You know, there's still a lot of kids that are looking for the shot. So, but yes, congratulations and thanks to Ed. And it was very, it was nice to see that um, Spencer and Penny, who were the famous dogs who cheer on the kids for the, the runners for the Boston marathon were also there as therapy dogs to help. So that was cool That's to great. see. Talk to a lot of grateful parents there, you know, it, it was a very, well run, very well thought out. Um, and a lot of parents just had a big sigh of relief that it went as, as efficiently and as well as it did. So thank yeah. you to Ed and everyone who worked mm. together. He's planning on doing another one very soon. December 1st. Yeah. Well, that, I believe that's for the second vaccine. That's for the second <laughs> dose. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, hopefully yeah. we'll be able to get some more kids in there. 
So anyway, congratulations to, to everybody involved with that. Um, um, just move into the Quarterville Road Bridge. I, I did update you on that before and, and the status of the bridge and how one of the, the lanes is really in tough shape. Um, since that point in time, Doug's gotten a little bit more anxious about it. And so we've talked about what we need to do to initiate a traffic management plan. Um, so we have, you know, looked at the budget. He's looking at 50,000 or an estimate of 50,000 to um, engineer and put together a traffic management plan for the bridge if, if it's necessary. Um, and then I think about, uh, excuse me, 100 and Yeah, three, uh, the remainder, so about 280000 that we could use to implement those uh, TMP traffic management plan uh, measures that we might need to do. Hopefully it doesn't come to this. And, um, and but, what would that look like, Michael, a traffic management plan? Well, that, yeah. would, that would more than likely mean going down to one lane. And so we would need to probably install some temporary lights to, to oh, make wow. that work. So it's... Um, it's certainly not ideal. Would there be any detours required going down to one lane? I mean, how is that going to be, you know, stop and go type like, like it used to be uh, when we're doing the bridges over on high and house street. You know, I believe Joe, you know, people, it would alternate sides. So, right. You know, you would have a stop light if you're coming East and that would allow the people going westbound to utilize that lane. And that's the line on the westbound side or eastbound side would go red and provide an opportunity for the other people to go across. So, like I said, certainly not ideal. Detours might not be required. I'm sure detours will be found if this. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Into I'm sure. So, so, Michael, what's, what's the potential timing of, of, you know, implementing something like this because it sounds like it's it's more critical than you you had initially thought. You know, because we had talked about you know sort of a further in the time horizon, but it sounds like this is more imminent. Yeah, Doug's going to go ahead and do the engineering for the traffic management plans and get that put in. You know, so we know what to do, or and then you know when it if and when it does come to pass that we need to shut down that lane, we'll be able to implement the, the measures right away. So I, you know, I don't, it's just hard to say it's, um, you know, hopefully it never happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully the, 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 again, the state is planning on replacing the bridge, you know, hopefully the, the state will do that before anything like this comes to pass. But, you know, Michael, this is didn't we get something measure to, um, you know, make sure that everything's, everything's safe didn't we get something on the bridge where we have to either do some design or right-of-way issues is that the same bridge or I am i thinking that, of a different bridge yeah i thought that was the uh, myrtle myrtle street bridge i could be wrong okay yeah because those bridges we own the middle yeah. street bridges the two the goal of the suburb river. okay yeah you'd be so surprised at how many bridges that we have that you just don't think about oh yeah you know, it's, uh, it's yeah. certainly enlightening and that's i think one of the important things about that infrastructure act that was signed is there's a lot of money that that is allocated for bridges yeah. so again hopefully that'll find its way to uh, ashland somehow you know i'm, I'm a little, michael if you don't mind me asking a question i know it, we're getting a little late here but what why isn't the state picking up the engineering design on this? And it's a, it's this, it's their bridge. And why do we have um, to come up with a traffic design uh, program that's going to help with their work? So there, so the the bridge, the replacement of that bridge, the permanent replacement, is on their long term plan, and that's a, you know, that's not necessarily. Um, What's the best way to say it? They've, they've been generous with that because as you know many times that bridge in that area has been deemed town property and the state's not maintaining it so you know i don't think it's unreasonable to ask us to okay just basically. just curious because it's just you know it's a state road state bridge and we're doing the engineering design that just i don't know 
Apples is that the state road, Pleasant and Cordova? Yeah, believe it. Yeah, yeah believe it or oh. not. Cordova so, Road is a state road. It's always it's it's been in dispute. So well, they're know, the ones who read who repaved it a couple of years ago, right? right? I remember the state coming in and doing a repaving project, and I was like, wait a minute, why are they doing it? And I, you oh. know, we we found out that it was a state road. Um, is this another? And I think we talked about this at the retreat. Is this something where it may have to get put on the tip, and we should be doing something about that? Because tip would be too long. Well, I that's the too- thing, right? I mean, the tip is a five year, you know, five years before they even start, and if the bridge is in that bad of shape. Yeah, um, the state has it through their bridge program. Okay. So they have funded funded it. So, Michael, do you know, just in terms of the state's plan, I mean, right now, when the T built the commuter rail station, uh, we had them put in that sidewalk, the kind of bridge sidewalk beside the bridge. So yeah. is the new bridge going to integrate uh, pedestrian, um, you know, sidewalk? I just want to make sure that's part of the new bridge. I don't are they going to keep Rob? the old but I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know, Rob. As, as you pointed out, the pedestrian bridge is a separate yeah. is a separate bridge. So I, I don't know if they're going to replace that one as well. We should just pay attention to that because that's going to need if they don't replace it and integrate it, they, that bridge will be it's over 20 years old now. So yeah. So okay. Um the next item under uh, town manager reports is uh, just an update on the police chief search. So we'll let you know that we've received 260 responses to our survey um, on uh, that asks a variety of different questions. Uh, certainly that survey is going to be used to guide the questions that, that we would use to ask candidates. Um, and I think, you know, it's going to be a very, very important tool for us. Um, I'm also in the process of putting together three focus groups, uh, one for community leaders, um, another based on race and cultural relations, and then a third um, based on the youth, on youth um, issues and and youth concerns. So I've already reached out to several people um, to start forming those, and they've agreed. And then I also have a, um, I'm also starting to put together a screening committee that would ultimately recommend finalists uh, to me to interview um, in public. I think we'll do it the way we did with um, Chief Davis. You know, we'll have public interviews. So how does all this work? Because uh, I'm really becoming sensitive to, um, you know, the work that Chief Briggs is doing right now and, uh, you know, wanting to be fair to him. So we'll be doing, what we're going to do is we're going to do an internal department survey next. So that will be for the department. We'll then start crafting the candidate profile and issuing the candidate profile. During that point in time, I will also be having these focus groups uh, with Chief Moore. And so that along with the survey is going to help guide uh, some of the questions that we will have. Um, And at that point, once we get resumes in, um, we'll have an opportunity to, um, Lisa and I will have an opportunity to review them. Hopefully we'll have a a number of good candidates. um, And then we would recommend like a group to the screening committee who would then uh, recommend uh, one or more finalists again to be interviewed. Michael, this question for you. Just um, so you know, we're we're using an outside firm to assist with this, correct? And so the purpose really is to make sure that we conduct as thorough and public of a process to be able to find the candidate that would be the best fit for for Ashland. Um, and so, how much of the process is sort of, for lack of a better word, run by outside of um, like outside of, of, of your office and then bringing stuff back to you to, to kind of, you know, in some sort of like digestible way or is it, or is it, um, or is it mostly, you know, we're driving the process and they're just kind of helping to execute. I'm just trying to see how, how it all fits together. 
Well, I can tell you, so let's take the survey, for example, both the one that we put out to the public as well as the internal survey that we're going to be doing. So Chief Moore is the one who initiates that and puts that together. Um, we review it and maybe make some tweaks. So really like on the survey that we put out to the public, the formatting was a little, was a little different than it wasn't necessarily user-friendly. So we made some changes to the format. And he'll be helping to conduct the focus groups as well. And, you know, asking some of the questions to, you know, hopefully um, draw out the information that we're looking to get. You know, I've, I've never done a, a police chief search before, really. Um, you know, Vin, when I hired Vin, he was going to be here for two months and ended up staying here for two years. I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, but, you know, Chief Moore has been through this before and his firm or not, it's not his firm, but he works for this firm. has been helping with that. I would like to just make sure that, that um, we put a, put a, an emphasis on, you know, extending the net as far as possible for candidates to make sure we include women and, and people of color as potential candidates for, for the, for the position, I just want to make sure that it's not um, not a very narrow search, and I, I I know that's your focus too, but I just want to make that you know my preference as well. It, it is, and, and Brandy, we're certainly going to encourage people to apply, especially women and, and uh, minority candidates or people of color. I, um, you know, my broader concern is getting candidates. Period. Um, you know, I'm. I'm not too many people want to be police chiefs. Not too many people want to be police officers right now. And I, I think it has definitely had a chilling effect on the candidate pool. In fact, I know it has. I mean, I've talked to several other uh, town managers and administrators and, and actually chiefs. So, um, you know, I think we're, we're very fortunate that we got Chief Briggs um, in this acting capacity. He's, he's, it takes a little bit of the pressure in terms of, of, of okay, we got to have somebody now. It takes a little bit of pressure off. But again, I, you know, I do want to be sensitive to, to his workload. And I, I want this to be a, f a full and fair process. Um, but it needs to be uh, timely. So, Michael, um, is, the, the, is the survey to the public closed now? No, it's open till November 30th. Okay. And is that on the town website? It's on the town's website. Um, I, I sent it through the email blast as well. Okay. Um, again, the response that we've gotten was, is very, um, in terms of numbers, has is, is been very, very good. And actually, yeah. good. Uh, and then what's your time frame? How are you seeing this go through and you know, when do you expect to wrap this whole thing up? Well, we'd like to put out the candidate profile um, in early December um, and give people opportunities to apply. And then, um, you know, I, I hope to have this all wrapped up by the end of January, if not sooner. It's going to, you know, when you involve more people in the process, you have more schedules that you have to take into account. So, um, so, that certainly I, is, is annual. But I think that's okay. I think that, you know, we want as much input in the process as possible to make it as open and, and involved. So if it takes a, a little longer, I mean, as you said, you want to be respectful of, of acting Chief Briggs, but um, I also think we want to do a, a thorough process and yeah, get nobody, as many nobody places involved as possible. So Yeah, nobody's disputed that. Okay. I think also, Michael, the, the as you described, the, the pool of candidates is going to also dictate, I think, the time frame or could could impact the time frame, depending on how many responses you get and whether, you know, everybody is satisfied with those responses. And, right. you know, there's been enough enough reporting lately about the uh, uh, the lack of, of both the uh, individuals entering the police uh, industry or and or the the number of retirements of police chiefs at this point yeah. in time so we're probably bumping up against a number of communities also looking to hire police chiefs 
It's correct. I mean, we've, I'll be frank, from just a staffing level, we're starting to reach crisis levels. And we're not the only community, you know, involved with that. I mean, every other community is going through it as well. Michael, so, this is not a non, this is a non-civil service position, correct? This is non-civil service, correct. Okay. You want me to move on to the next item? Do you feel, you feel comfortable with that? Okay. I do, but um, I just have one quick question. Sure. If you don't mind. The, um, the interest groups that, you, that you're reaching out to, you mentioned the youth, but I didn't hear anything about the senior citizen group or uh, mental health uh, advocates. And I think those two groups should be part of that because right now the PD is always dealing with mental health issues as, you know, as either as first responders or whatever. So I'm just wondering whether or not those that, that was taken into consideration. It, it absolutely was. Um, there will be representation um, amongst those groups. Okay. Amongst, you know, that set. And I think you'll see it in, in more than one individual. Okay. No, thank you. I just, yeah. I just didn't hear it at first. So that's why I just want to make sure that's going to happen. Okay. We're good. Okay. Um, so the next item, I just want to appreciate or put out some thanks to uh, everybody who attended the Veterans Luncheon on Monday. It was a great event. I uh, really would like to thank the uh, Police and Fire Association for putting that on and serving, um, and also Joanne and her staff, Anna, especially for um, working to, to make that happen and all the logistics. Um, it was great. We had a Tuskegee Airman. Uh, 90, I believe 94 years old, come yeah. and speak and provide a, a presentation. And uh, it, it's just remarkable what he had to go through and, and you know, other um, people of color had to go through back in the day just to be considered on an equal intellectual level um, yeah. as others. It, it's it's, it's kind of crazy and it's really not that long ago when you think about it, just in the grand scheme of... Uh, yeah society and civilization. And of course, we, you know, we have a lot, lot further to go. Um, so thank you to everybody who did that. It was a great program. Um, speaking of programs, um, our annual turkey uh, program is going to, the turkey pickup is going to happen next week, uh, next Monday, I believe. Um, is that right, Jen? Okay. So we have about 70 plus turkeys that we're, we're distributing. Um, really, Really want to thank the community center staff uh, for putting this together. It's really been a, a team effort this year, incredible team effort. Um, and of course, Jen has been in the middle of it all, of course. Um, so we're really excited about that um, and just the way everything came together and the way the team pulled together. Um, next, uh, I want to make sure everybody knows that the sustainability committee is going to hold a meet the sustainability uh, committee event tomorrow. I believe it's at 7 p.m. Um, it is a Facebook event. Um, I believe it's virtual. And so they're going to be there to give an update on how Ashland has progressed in its sustainability efforts over the years and what our plans are moving forward. Um, so again, I would encourage everybody to, uh, to attend that. If you have the time, they're a great group, a great committee. Um, and then finally, um, just wanted to give you a hiring update. So um, we're on the verge of, of making an offer to a conservation agent. Um, so we had some final interviews today. We've had, uh, we've had a lot of participation in the interviews. So um, Carl and Peter and Jen did the first round. And uh, so today, Kathy, the chair of the Conservation Commission, and I interviewed a couple of finalists. And uh, so we hope to make a decision really soon. And then that person would go we're going to have um, have them introduce themselves to the conservation commission, and before um, you know, before making any final decisions. So that's all I have tonight. One question: hiring um, sustainability coordinator. What are we doing there, Jen? Do you have an update on that one? Yeah, so that's posted, um, and we have. Um, a, a few resumes. I have to sort of work with Peter um, to review those. There was a few. Um, one of the reasons why, excuse me, I invited Peter to sit on the first round interview panel for the conservation agent is because we had a few that could potentially be good fits for um, one or the other. Um, and so we have 
uh, interviewed a couple of those um, and we'll sort of keep those in, in the back of our head and then also look at the new uh, candidate pool that's coming in now. Okay, great, thank you. I'm a, I'll entertain a motion to go past 10 o'clock. So moved. The second. Second. Thank you begrudgingly, I appreciate that. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye, okay. We can continue. You're all set, Mike? Yeah. Good. Okay, thank you. Question about the turkeys. Did the people have to uh, pre-register to get those turkeys? Yes. They did? Okay. All right. <coughs> thank you. All right. Uh, we'll start with ladies first this evening. We'll go, uh, Ms. Kinsman. Okay. You're on. I don't have very much. I am going to be doing office hours over at the bagel table this Saturday at 10 o'clock um, from 10 to 11 before heading over to um, to the farmer's market. But um, so <laughs> see, see, Steve, I, I did both. I plugged mine and yours too. Um, so I'll be at the bagel table. Come find me and ask any questions that you have about what's going on in Ashland. Um, the uh, ABA is hosting a comedy night on Sunday, the 21st. Corey Rodriguez did an event for the ABA last year, a virtual event, and it was hysterical. He's so funny. Um, so if uh, people want to register, I think they can still go on the uh, Ashland Business Association's website and register for that. So that's this Sunday. And the only other thing I have is um, just something that's kind of really close to my heart. Um, over at the Ashland High School, the cross country team, we had three, um, three runners that qualified individually for all states. Um, Amelia Agostino, uh, Brooke Boulanger and um, Chris Moriarty. And this is the first time three individuals have ever qualified for all states. Um, so it's exciting. And then we also Found out some, some exciting news late yesterday that the girls team won an at-large um, spot for uh, all states as well. So the girls team will be competing next weekend um, with, um, with, the, with, with Chris Moriarty, the only, the only boy, but um, I wish them all the best. They're gonna uh, do great at Rentham and uh, it's been fun watching them and being kind of a part of that. And it's exciting for for the school as well. This is the first time a, the, the, the girls have ever been uh, have ever been there. So good luck to them. That's all for me. That's awesome. And congratulations to them all. Very good. Okay, Ms. Yolanda, you're up. Uh, let's see. So on Monday, we had a 10 to 50 Main Street Forum. I think it was very productive the uh, Rich Gordon, the developer and his architect gave, a, I think, a really good presentation next iteration on the project. And with that, we have decided to have a hybrid forum on Monday, December 13th at 7 p.m. Um, so people can either come to town hall. Right, Michael, we're still planning that. Yes. Yes. Come to town hall or they'll also be available via Zoom. And I've also let WACA know that, that that's happening. Um, a lot of good input. And I think it, it's time for the public to take a look at that. We did have uh, an update on the Mindus project um, from Paul. And our next meeting for that is on November 29th at 6 p.m. Uh, Brandy talked about the comedy night. Uh, a little further out, but December 5th, the Friends of the Ashland Public Library and the Public Library together are having a library art exhibit, and it ties into the fundraiser that they're doing online of children's book art. Uh, really cool stuff. Um, Mina, our new public direct, our library director, has come in with a lot of great ideas based on things that she's done at other libraries that she's worked at. And she has gotten artists and authors to donate some wonderful art. So you, I think you can go on the public library website. Um, that auction starts on December 1st. It runs through the 8th. It's an online auction. Um, and then the exhibit and event is happening on Sunday, December 5th. I know there's a bunch of other stuff going on coming up, but I don't have, I know there's um, December 4th, there's an event. So 
be on the lookout because as we head into the holidays, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Thank you. And if we don't remember, just go online and take a look at the calendar. The events yep, calendar. Yep, it's all there. It's there. It's there. Yep. So if you can't uh, if you can't remember, then go online. Okay, next I have two gentlemen. Let me see. Do I want to go age or beauty? Let me think. And um, there's that word gentleman. That's maybe all I, I know, gentlemen. All right. So uh Rob, you're next, seeing that uh, okay. I had a wonderful discussion with your mother-in-law the other day okay oh that's nice um yeah just uh actually just one item but i, I did want to have a question you know uh, you, you know uh yolanda talked about 1050 main street we should probably put it on our agenda for our next meeting which is shortly before that public forum just to kind of review what's been going on with that does that seem like a good idea like i know there was been some news and so we should think about that yeah, I think it'll be, um, hi, Marsha. Uh, I think it'll be probably prudent to have, have that discussion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Trust my, anyway, yeah, <laughs> so that's good. Um, the only, I just had a quick update. The MBK advisory board met uh, yesterday. Um, and uh, the, uh, the guest was the, uh, the federal uh, transportation administrator for region one. Uh, and basically, the uh, option, the uh, agenda was talking about the um, the infrastructure bill money. And as you, as you mentioned earlier, Michael, there will be a lot of transportation funding, uh, a lot of funding of different kinds, but especially transportation funding. And um, so the the T is uh, looking at um, a lot of capital projects. So hopefully, we can get some done, you know, with station improvements and as well as all the other mass transit uh, improvements that are under consideration so that's uh, maybe. I, there wasn't really much talk about individual municipalities it's really more like the state is running things but the state is going to do some um uh competitive grant programs i think but i'm not it's not clear to me exactly where we might fit into this as an individual municipality but there will be funding over you know again substantial funding so that's uh good news um and maybe we can get these stations improved so mm. Anyway, well, maybe get our legislators involved in that too. Yeah, I mean it's, but Can't you know be. it's good news, and uh, you know they're going to be improving uh, mass transit. So, and you see Michelle Wu, the new mayor, has gotten she's got some free bus lines. I guess they're paying the fee to run them for free, which is an interesting experiment. So it's kind of stuff that I think we'll end up help. paying for it. Yeah. No, no, she got well. This, I think the city's paying the state, as far as I can understand, and then she's lobbying for more funds but you know anyway oh and the other thing is the new uh board member uh mayor coke of quincy again expressed interest in in coming out after the holidays and maybe looking at some of these lines so that was nice um and you know hopefully we can arrange something like that to meet uh you know one of the mbta board members i'll leave it up to you to give the invitation yeah well, we probably, you know, do it with framing him some of the other stops, yeah. of course. But that, mm -hmm. that could be good. Sounds All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Mr. Steven. Thank you, Joe. Uh, just a couple of things. We already touched on the, uh, the Valentine subcommittee uh, information. Uh, just want to make note that uh, today was the final day for the BPA grant applications to be submitted. Oh, yes. Uh, and typically, Susan compiles everything. She'll provide uh, provide us with uh, the PDFs of all the applications. Uh, Rob and I, as soon as we receive that, Rob and I will schedule a subcommittee meeting. And uh, I would assume that we would be prepared for December 8th meeting to uh, make our, make our, our grants uh, 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 notices. So that's coming up. Uh, so I know we talked about that. We either talked about it or we received a, a notice about the work on, on Union Street around the Fountain Street intersection. And they've already started, apparently DPW has already started to remove those raised traffic structures. And it looks like in preparation for the, the redoing that intersection, which is critical to the whole public safety building flow of vehicles. 
uh, over Fountain Street. So that that's interesting. It looks like they're they're moving pretty quickly with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It wasn't expected to take too too long. Yeah. Good. So, uh, and then the last thing on my list is uh, uh, just some lions notices. Uh, so we've talked earlier about the uh, thanks to the Thanksgiving turkey giveaway. Uh, you know, talking about the the need in the community for uh, for those that 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 have food insecurities in their in their lives and. So the Lions last Saturday held uh, their, actually their first food drive in, in a couple of years uh, and a very successful, uh, delivered 90 boxes of food to the food pantry. Uh, they're stacked uh, very neatly in a storage area. Uh, it's gonna take some time to put them all away, no doubt. Uh, our new food pantry coordinator was at the uh, was at the uh, Lions meeting last night and uh, and spoke to that. But uh, so that was uh, Lions accomplished that this past Saturday. And then just a note that uh, the Lions traditional Christmas tree lot is no longer on Route 126. That lot is no oh, longer Lord. available. Uh, and with the construction that's going on, is probably for the best anyway. Uh, it the Lions Christmas trees are being sold at the VFW in the back, uh, and they're all set up. And uh, there'll be Christmas tree sales start the Saturday after uh, after Thanksgiving. So it's uh, it's that time of year, mm -hmm. and that's all I have, Joe. So uh, you know, happy Thanksgiving to everybody, and uh, looking forward to a you know really good holiday season. Absolutely. Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> uh, just quick update on the, uh, we discussed it already, but the uh, public safety building uh, committee met uh, the, other, uh, the other day. I thought it was a very productive and a very, uh, very good meeting. A lot of things were done. A lot of things were discussed. Um, the, big, the big key right now is the, the lobby. And one of the things is we want to make sure when people come in, the first thing they see is a nice, a nice, uh, you know, front foyer that, that, you know, they can be proud of because they'll never see the interior of the, unless they get arrested. But, you know, um, at least it's something for them to, to be proud of, you know, when they yeah. come, into, come into the new building. So they're working on that and it's greatly appreciated by everybody. And, I, and I'm very proud of everybody that put the time and effort into uh, the design, the construction, uh, Steve taking notes and doing the things that he needs to do. Uh, and Jen, uh, as the lead person on a lot of this. So thank you for everything that you guys and, and gals have done for, for that. Um, and lastly, um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all. It's been, uh, it's been a, a heck of a ride so far this year. We got a lot done. We still have a lot more to do. And for all of you uh, who celebrate the holidays, this is time to be with your family. Enjoy it. Because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You have no idea. So with that, uh, and the reason why so I Joe, say that. Beforehand, just, I just want to remind sure. people, town meeting is December 1st, 6 o'clock at yep. the high school. Um, I know we talked about the warrant article and stuff, but <clears throat> remind people, put it on your calendar now, um, December 1st at the <clears throat> high school for town meeting. It should be fairly quick, but we need people there. So are we meeting? That was that, the last thing that I wanted to bring up. Are we meeting earlier that evening i don't think so we'll probably set something up joe we usually okay. do that just in case something comes up all right i just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that we may be meeting early so i just right. but you know we're not we probably well what's the odds i don't know i, I have no idea all right <laughs> you know every day i walk into something <laughs> so, okay. you know it's it's like let's make a deal do a one two or three <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, okay. 